Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, sorry we had some technical difficulties first thing out of the shoot. Um, thanks for joining us, though. Uh, I'd like to start by saying uh, pretty proud to be here right now. We've got a lot of amazing people, uh, not only on our fire department, but in our community. We're volunteering a lot of time and effort into education for us uh, and the members of Local 1285. Uh, I think you all know us, but my name is Anthony Klinker. Nick Rhodes. Uh, and we uh, represent Local 1285's Health and Wellness Committee. Uh, we're going to jump right into it because we've got a late start. Uh, start, we've got uh, Chief Austin Abercrombie, Battalion 4A. Uh, Chief's been with us for 20 years. He's going to give us a uh, uh, education piece on heart health. So, Chief Abercrombie. If any of you, sorry, if there's any of you that have any questions during this for the presenter, um, go ahead and write it down in the chat box down below, and we'll save them to the end, and we'll read them to the presenter at the end if you have any questions. All righty. Hi there, my name is Austin. Uh, like they said, Battalion Chief, uh, Las Vegas Fire and Rescue. So kind of just going to my fitness journey, uh, enlisted in the Marine Corps when I was 18 years old, and then 23-ish uh, got into the uh, Fire Academy, and I had a great uh, RTO, Lou Fonseca, who at one point in the Academy pulled me aside and he kind of challenged me and called me up and he said like, I really expect you to be kicking ass and, and taking more names, and so, Took a few years for that message to sink in. And then uh, years later, I'm a paramedic at Station 10. And my captain, Steve Ranke, uh, was in better shape than everybody on the crew. He uh, was always in the gym, always working out. And if you knew Steve or know Steve, he's an avid runner, avid cyclist. And uh, being around him had a, had a great positive impact. And uh, through his influence and then Lewis's influence, uh, I kind of transformed myself into a cardio nut and uh, really felt like I wanted to be in shape because uh, you can't expect to make good decisions on the fire ground if you're constantly out of breath and uh, hypoxic. So if you wanna have command presence, be able to uh, recognize you know, fire ground red flags, you've gotta have uh, your brain thinking. And, and so uh, being in shape is, is critical to that. And so is your uh, cardiovascular recovery time, which is uh, impacted by, by how good a shape you're in. So each year I was always trying to get into better shape uh, in the Marine Corps to be able to get a perfect score on the physical fitness test. You had to run eight, uh, excuse me, uh, three miles in 18 minutes. I could never do that when I was in the Marine Corps. I still can't do it, but I was working toward it, right? I um, got up to the point where I could run a six minute mile. I'm trying to work toward being able to run uh, three miles in 18 minutes. Uh, each year got my VO2 a little bit higher. I got my VO2 up to 59. I was looking forward to breaking 60 and uh, was doing a lot of hills, a lot of max heart rate training, uh, a lot of heart rate, you know, 170 plus. Um, my resting heart rate was under 50, felt like I was in great shape, everything's going good, and then all of a sudden things fell apart. So I first noticed that I was having uh, small runs of palpitations. I got on the monitor, saw that I was in SVT, and the SVT always resolved within a minute. And so for those of you that, that aren't paramedics or don't have medical training, SVT stands for supraventricular tachycardia, which is basically when you have a heart rate in excess of uh, 200 beats per minute. And when your heart's beating that fast, you can't refill the blood in your heart fast enough to keep up with the, out, with the, the pace. So your, uh, your blood flow out of your heart goes down a lot. So you're, you're basically redlining your heart, but you're not redlining your performance. And so uh, when I got those palpitations, they always went away, uh, never really impacted my performance because it never lasted longer than, than 30 seconds. But uh, one day last year, the palpitations didn't stop and all of a sudden they felt slower and more uncomfortable. And when I put myself on the monitor, I saw that I was in atrial fibrillation. So. Uh, what's atrial fibrillation? So atrial fibrillation, uh, most paramedics or everybody in the fire department knows that uh, ventricular fibrillation is when your heart is basically just quivering and not pumping any blood at all. And so uh, we show up, we put the pacer, or, you know, the fibrillation pads on you, and we shock you out of that and hopefully, hopefully bring you back. Uh, atrial fibrillation, the, uh, the ventricles are still working, so you're still conscious but your atria are doing that same quivering action that, that your ventricles would be doing if, if you were in V-fib. 
And so when you're in atrial fibrillation, uh, you have no atrial kick, you have reduced preload into the ventricles, which is gonna reduce your blood flow. You're now at increased risk of stroke because your, your atria are basically just quivering and like churning butter almost with your, with your blood. And that's gonna have a huge negative impact on, on performance. So people in atrial fibrillation, excuse me, uh, atrial fibrillation usually get uh, lightheaded, symptomatic, and uh, not able to perform. So uh, you're probably wondering like, what is the general incidence of uh, atrial fibrillation in the, in the adult population? So it's about 1%. So 1% of the population has atrial fibrillation and the median age for that is about 70 years old. It's 66 years old for men and uh, 74 years old for women. And so here's where it gets interesting. 1% uh, of the population, median age 70, LVFR has 600 people on the floor, but we have six people with atrial fibrillation. So uh, Jackie Blomini, Mari Busio, Chuck Freeland, David Lewis, uh, John Buckley, myself. So that's 1% of our organization, but none of us are, are 70 years old, right? And uh, the median age of onset for, for our people seems to be about 40. And clearly we are very different from, from the general population to have this happening to us. So if you add in recent retirees with heart arrhythmias, you've got uh, Steve Ranke, Travis Holdaway, Lou Fonseca, Brian Miller. So now we're at almost 2% of our population and still no one is at uh, the median age of the, the general population where, where that would onset. So why are firefighters getting arrhythmias uh, more than the general population? Got a book that explains that. So this is the Haywire Heart. Uh, been reading this and it's all about uh, athletes and arrhythmias. So the, uh, the tagline on it is uh, how too much exercise can kill you and what you can do to protect your heart. So uh, everything that I'm gonna be citing here pretty much comes from this book. I'm not taking credit for anything. The authors of the book are uh, Chris Case, who's the managing editor of Velo News. Uh, obviously you have to be a pretty serious cyclist to get that job. He also has a neuroscience degree. John Mandrola, who's a cardiac electrophysiologist that, those are the people that go in and repair your heart if you have uh, atrial fibrillation. He's also an avid runner, cyclist. And then Leonard Zinn, who's a lifelong uh, endurance athlete with the USA National uh, Cycling Team and has a physics degree. So the people that, that wrote this book did their homework. They've uh, identified all their sources and all the studies and everything. So they, they know what they're talking about. Uh, so the, speci the book specifically talks about endurance athletes. Uh, which they defied as anyone who partakes in daily uh, uh, challenging exercise, only it's not performed for a season, it's performed for uh, like a decade or more, right? So if you, if you played football in high school, like maybe even in college, that was, that was eight years. We're talking about people that are competing for uh, long periods of time, which definitely firefighters fit into that because our careers are going 10, 10, to, 10 to 30 years. Uh, most everybody's doing 20 plus. And so uh, most people on the fire department would fit into the, to that category. And there's growing science that says that the relationship uh, between exercise and fitness could be U-shaped. So we all know that exercise makes you uh, more in shape and more healthy, but the, the science is starting to show that there's a point of diminishing returns where too much exercise can actually decrease your fitness uh, or decrease your health, not decrease your fitness, but uh, where you're, your returns based on your exercise are actually negatively impacting your, your long-term health. So um, on another thought, if you're into uh, uh, EKGs, arrhythmias, health in general, uh, pure fitness trainer type stuff, highly recommend this book. It would be great for the uh, paramedic school curriculum because it helps you really go deep into uh, arrhythmias and it makes it more applicable to your uh, lifestyle, right? Instead of looking at uh, um, Superventricular tachycardia is a problem that senior citizens get. Now it's a problem that, that you could get. So it's a completely different uh, shift on how we teach it normally. So going back into uh, the heart. So your heart beats about 100,000 times a day for your entire life. And that's the muscular equivalent of squeezing a tennis ball 72 times a minute. So if you squeezed a tennis ball 72 times a minute with your hand, your hand would get really tired. And uh, if you uh, imagine having to do that every minute, every hour, every day for your entire life. That puts in perspective how much endurance and how strong your heart is. 
So we all know athletes develop stronger hearts with uh, increased stroke volume. Uh, they pump more blood. That reduces your resting heart rate. So even with uh, three hours of daily exercise at a heart rate of uh, 127 average, athletes average about 88,000 beats per minute per day, uh, excuse me, beats per day uh, due to increased efficiency. So an athlete's heart is beating less per day than a non-athlete. So non-athlete, 100,000 beats per day. Athlete, even with all the exercise they're doing, 88,000 beats per day. And firefighters, we think in terms of gallons per minute. So uh, your heart at rest is pumping uh, 1.3 gallons per minute, which is the equivalent of having a kitchen faucet on full open forever, right? And so, uh, but at max output, if you're highly trained, like you're in phenomenal shape, you can run your heart up to eight gallons per minute. So that's, that's a, a massive change in performance from at rest to uh, full performance. So how does that affect your blood pressure? So uh, your systolic blood pressure will increase uh, 30 to 50 percent during exercise and your diastolic blood pressure will actually drop. So that's why guys, you know, they're doing their weightlifting and they get that nice vasodilation effect, right? That's you get that pump. That's that's from that uh, diastolic blood pressure drop. Your, your blood vessels are dilating. So remember that your uh, your left blood ventricle, your left ventricle is pumping blood to your entire body, right? And it's going to have to, it, it's increasing its uh, pressure uh, up to 50%. So if your regular blood pressure is uh, 120 over 70, it's increasing uh, 30 to 50% during exercise. Now go over to the right side of your heart. The right side of your heart is pumping blood to your lungs. And if you're working out, you're going to need a lot of oxygen. So the right side of your heart is uh, critical critical to, to what you got going on there. And your uh, pulmonary blood pressure, this is where it gets super interesting, uh, is, is actually really low. Your pulmonary blood pressure is only uh, 20 over 8. But your pulmonary blood pressure during exercise can increase 400%. Uh, so the right side of your heart is actually looking at a uh, massive uh, change in what the resistance is versus the left side of the heart is, right? So the left side of the heart has a no more than 50% increase in pressure, but the right side of the heart is looking at a 400% increase in pressure. So uh, elite athletes, again, are the ones that are gonna see that 400% that increase in, in pressure. If you're uh, you know, just sitting at home doing the computer and you never have uh, any sort of active lifestyle, you're not gonna see that uh, that, that pressure change. So how does that affect us as firefighters? So uh, when you sustain injury, uh, your body sends white blood cells to repair the damage. And the whole concept of weight training is that you, uh, you create uh, micro tears in your muscle and then your muscle grows back stronger after healing those, that, that damage. So various chemicals interact to produce scar tissue. And when you uh, repair your muscles or your elbow from an injury or your skin, that scar tissue on wherever else it is, is probably fine. But when you develop scar tissue on your heart, now you're ta look, talking about uh, possible problems. So athletes and us as firefighters, we're constantly subject to, to micro trauma. Imagine the load you're putting yourself under every single time you step off the rig in full turnouts. You might not, you're not breaking a bone, but you're subjecting all sorts of parts of your body to tiny microscopic trauma that your body's having to repair. Same whether you're playing football or uh, doing intense weight training, which all of us do on you know, our days off and everything, uh, work hard, play hard type mentality. And so uh, trauma causes inflammation and inflammatory cytokines like uh, TNF and IL-6 build up in your body. And athletes are gonna have higher levels of those circulating in their body than non-athletes. So you've got higher levels of inflammatory compounds circulating in your body than a non-athlete does, okay? And without proper recovery time, those chemicals build up in your body and affect your uh, mood depression, right? Then there's a biological reason for that. When those uh, inflammation chemicals build up in your body, your, your, your body wants to tell you, don't go work out again. That's why it depresses your mood. And so now you get tight, you get uh, increased fatigue, reduced immune function, and it also disrupts 
uh, immuno acid production, which is what you need to maintain muscle growth and uh, keep your muscle mass. So all those things are uh, negatively affected by your recovery time if you don't get enough of it. And then uh, you guys are all familiar with uh, Mickey Olivas. You can get into a catabolic state from overtraining. Uh, so Mickey was, is a phenomenal athlete, but he basically overtrained himself into rhabdomyolysis where his muscles were literally eating themselves. So uh, kind of reinforces the importance of uh, having sufficient recovery time. So where do this uh, increase in blood pressure and uh, uh, these inflammatory chemicals flowing around your body, how does that apply to us and arrhythmias? So they studied rats and they, they had a uh, control group of rats and they gave them one hour of exercise uh, five days a week for 16 weeks. So they basically had these super fit rats. And they found that the exercised rats had lower heart rates, atrial dilation, atrial fibrosis, so scarring on their atria, and uh, enhanced vulnerability to atrial fibrillation. They did that by stimulating their heart into, into atrial fibrillation, right? And then uh, the control rats, the non-exercised rats, didn't have any of those, those problems. And so uh, after detraining the rats, taking the rats off the, the training program, that resulted in uh, rapid reversal of the vagal enhancement, uh, took away the atrial uh, fibrillation vulnerability. However, the damage, the fibrosis, and the scarring of their hearts remained. So the conclusions are that an exercised heart is more uh, sensitive to vagal stimulation and arrhythmia than a non-exercised heart. Um, so you've got scarring, atrial dilation, vagal sensitivity, and uh, abnormal heart tissue. All that creates uh, conditions that are ripe for atrial fibrillation. And then here's where, more interestingly, uh, and ties in with some of the other topics we're talking about today. Another, and this is where the book is so great, is they, they cite all their, their studies. Another completely independent u university repeated the same study, and they found the same results, but this time they genetically engineered the rats to remove, um, to make, uh, they treated some rats with TNF blocker, which is the inflammation compound that builds up in your body, and uh, when they had uh, rats treated with the TNF blocker or they were uh, genetically engineered without TNF producing genes, those rats, both those controlled groups did not show atrial remodeling due to scarring. So those rats were basically atrial fibrillation immune uh, due to the physiological changes from, from that. So uh, we, they can't do tests like that on people because we can't genetically engineer people. So, and Unfortunately, the rats didn't make it, so uh, that's, why, that's why there's not a lot of studies on this on people. So, uh, so now bringing this information back to firefighters, you take your athletic firefighter body, you subject it to constant microtrauma, you fill it with inflammatory chemicals, and then you tax the right side of your heart to the max by going out and fighting fire, and you do that uh, uh, while you're sleep deprived, working 72 hour shifts, and the right side of the heart takes damage, and when it heals itself, it builds scar tissue. And if that scar tissue builds up in the wrong spot, the electrical signals to your uh, heart all originate in the right atria. And so when those electrical signals run into the, uh, the scar tissue, if that scar tissue is in the wrong spot, now you get into an arrhythmia. Does that make sense? So uh, the science that proves this is, is pretty extensive. Uh, there's been uh, Lots of studies, the book specifically cites uh, six different studies that show that athletes are two to five times more likely to develop atrial fibrillation than non-athletes. And better race times and higher performance uh, increased your incidence of, of getting that. And non, so basically non-athletes just don't have the inflammation and training stimulus necessary to cause the physiological changes to get into these problems. Additionally, athletes have lower heart rates, and lower heart rates and enhanced vagal tune give the heart more time in between beats to get fussy, for lack of a better word, which increases the chance of an arrhythmia. So how does firefighting compare with uh, endurance athlete training? Well, we know firefighting is very taxing. You're wearing 70 pounds of gear under high stress with a max heart rate, elevated body temperatures, sleep-deprived conditions, Sounds like we're doing all the things that, that we need to do to uh, strain our heart, cause damage, create a scar, and uh, uh, 
damage ourselves and get into an arrhythmia. So I think that, that connection is pretty, pretty clear. Uh, what does that mean that we do as an organization? I, I think we have to consciously recognize that it's, this is going to affect 2 to 5% because they're saying uh, 2 to 5% of athletes are going to get this. So 2 to 5% of the people in our organization are going to get this. So out of 600 firefighters, that means 6 to 30 of us are, are going to get it. And uh, does that mean that we stop training? No, absolutely not. Like we have to train. We know that some of us are going to get cancer, but we aren't stopping firefighting because we know firefighting causes cancer. So, but there are things that we can do to reduce it. Uh, step one is to have a healthy lifestyle to begin with. So you got to make sure you're getting adequate rest, have a healthy diet, don't overtrain, and allow your body time uh, between workouts to flush out inflammation before you start another workout cycle. Another interesting thing that they uh, have uncovered is the link between self-esteem and inflammation. So athletes link their performance to their self-esteem. So when, when I'm in shape and I'm performing, I feel good and I'm happy. But if I'm not performing, my self-esteem goes down, right? And so uh, when your self-esteem goes down, they know that your inflammation actually goes up and you're actually creating a self-defeating cycle of low self-esteem, greater inflammation, causing more damage, which makes you less likely to train again, which is more reducing your self-esteem even more. So it's important to not link your athletic performance with your self-esteem. Recognize that getting injured and uh, having to take time to recover are going to be part of life, and you're going to have to do that in order to sustain your performance. And uh, don't allow yourself to get wrapped up in perfectionism. Uh, it's going to be self-destructive if you do that. You have to accept that you're getting older, and that the job's going to take a toll on us. If you, if you don't do that, it's, it's going to be even more detrimental for you. So don't let uh, your performance change who you are or who you want to be on the inside. So additionally, if you develop palpitations or you have a high number of uh, preventricular, uh, premature ventricular cat, uh, excuse me, uh, contractions, PVCs, which are the first step in getting into a more serious arrhythmia, and so this is where uh, I want to be clear who I'm talking to. I'm talking to everybody on the floor right now. Just because you don't have atrial fibrillation doesn't mean that you don't have heart problems. And the first sign of heart problems is palpitations. And I've talked to, since I've been going around the floor, like telling people what I've been going through, a lot of people have been like, yeah, I get palpitations. Okay. Palpitations are basically short runs of SVT or elevated heart rate, what have you. And given enough time, uh, those can progress into atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, other arrhythmias. So if you're having palpitations, I uh, highly suggest that you uh, file a C1 and go see a cardiologist. Uh, make sure that you, you file that C1 within seven days of, of the incident. And uh, so can, if you are having, if that de describes you, you might want to consider reducing your training intensity. Studies have shown that uh, uh, detraining can reduce the incidence of arrhythmias. As firefighters, we can't, uh, we can't really quit training. You have to train if you want to do this job. But you don't have to max out all the time on your training. So uh, my previous regimen was really focused on uh, VO2 max and high heart rate stuff. Did a lot of sprints, hills, intervals, getting my heart rate up to 170, 180. Uh, I'm not doing that anymore. But now I'm really more focused on general cardiac health. I do 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, uh, four to five times a week cardio, and I try to keep my heart rate between uh, 130, 160, and when I start getting closer to 160, I start to back off a little bit, right, because I don't want to do more damage. Um, also, you want to reduce your alcohol intake. There's a documented increase in arrhythmias with alcohol consumption, and uh, check your caffeine consumption. The book authors cite studies that actually state that there's not a link between caffeine and arrhythmias. I've just personally felt like there's been times where I've been more susceptible to get into SVT and AFib based upon my caffeine consumption. And I love coffee and I'm not, I don't want to give it up ever. Um, so, but if you're getting palpitations, working 72 hours, getting no sleep and powering through it with rock stars is probably not in, in your best interest or your family's best interest. So uh, you got to get enough rest. I can't say this enough. If you're not, if you can't get rest at work and I, I know you, you can't, uh, you need to get it at home. I know you don't want to take a nap as soon as you get home, uh, especially if you've got kids or you know, you're single and you can do whatever you want. You want to go have fun. You need to get a nap in. So uh, when you're young, 
you're probably not hearing what I'm saying, but when you get older, trust me, you're gonna you're gonna wish you took that nap and, and took better care of yourself. So uh, that's my presentation. In the words of Daryl Aronson, perform, survive, retire. So performing is what the city and the taxpayers want us to do, but surviving is what we need to do for ourselves and our families. So make self-care a priority. Unhealthy and sick firefighters can't save anyone, least of all themselves. So uh, another Daryl Aronson quote, uh, retire healthy and strong. So that's the goal. Any questions? Okay, so the question is, uh, was the first round of palpitations that I had, uh, did they get progressively worse or, and, uh, and, and what was that sensation like? And basically it just feels like your heart is beating really fast, faster than you're used to for your normal level of exertion. And for me, for some guys it's symptomatic, like they feel lightheaded and weak. For me, uh, I just felt like I was super fast heart rate, zero discomfort, zero pain. Um, not really a performance decrease, just a sensation that like, oh, this isn't right, right? And as soon as I would step off the treadmill, it would, it would usually go away, or if it happened on the fire ground, uh, if I would just stop, it would, it would go away. Uh, and then also, I could vagal out of SVT. So if I just held my breath and bared down, I could vagal out of, as, out of SVT right away. But with atrial fibrillation, uh, I couldn't vagal out of that. I did get it to end once uh, by getting into a swimming pool, but uh, the other times I had to get, get shocked out of it, so. What are you doing now to monitor? Uh, Apple Watch, uh, I've, okay, a question is what am I doing now to, to monitor? Uh, so I'm under the care of a cardiologist, that's the most important thing, and I've had two cardiac ablations. So for those of you that don't know what a cardiac ablation is, that's when they, uh, you go into the cath lab, they feed catheters up your uh, femoral arteries, they stimulate your heart with electrical wires to try to find the uh, bad uh, cells, and then they damage those cells to uh, repair the heart so that the electric, bad electrical signals can't continue. And so out of the uh, 10 firefighters that I just listed that have had uh, atrial arrhythmias, uh, eight of them have had uh, ablations. So I've had two, might need a third, fingers crossed, hopefully not, but if, if necessary, I, I'm gonna, I'll do it. Um, so back to the question, what do you do to monitor? Uh, be under the care of a cardiologist. Um, I watch on my Apple Watch. If I get into SVT, I record it, uh, track how long it lasts. If you're in this position, you, you, you need to be on blood thinners because uh, atrial fibrillation incle increases your, your risk of stroke. Um, so just monitor it, you kind of become a little expert on your own uh, heart health, having to live with it. So. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so what kind of stuff can your fellow firefighter do to monitor it to, to help you out? You know, are there any physical signs that they can look out for to see, hey, this person might be having some cardiac issues and they should you know, start that talk? Uh, yeah, you, you won't know unless somebody uh, tells you, but I think it does tie in with, with safety on the fire ground. We all think that uh, if you're assigned fire medical on the fire ground that, you know, you're, oh, that just means I'm gonna sit in the rescue and not really do anything on, on this incident. But really you need, to, you need to grab your gurney and your gear and you need to move forward because we all know that uh, 100 firefighters die per year, 50 of those die from cardiac causes. So you don't have to be, you know, fat and out of shape to uh, su succumb to uh, heart problems. You could just be uh, young, fit, not enough sleep, too much Red Bull, and uh, your heart goes into an arrhythmia, and because you're in full turnouts, you, didn't, uh, you don't want to tell your coworkers, hey, my heart's beating too fast, right, because we have this, this macho culture, and, and so instead, you continue to push yourself until you pass out. So. Uh, I think we should tell each other, like if you get un you know, uh, uncomfortable on the fire ground and you don't feel like you can safely do your job, you absolutely need to tell your captain and, and, and come out and be evaluated. But um, 
unfortunately, there's not a lot you can do to, to just, you're not going to see it in another person. And I mean, if they're checking their pulse, like I used to always, I check my pulse at the, at the gym during the, uh, uh, during the classes and I could tell I was making the instructor uncomfortable because she's looking at me like, uh, I'm going to pass out. And then I talked to her after the class and she said, the last guy that was checking his pulse in my class went into cardiac arrest in my thing. So I'm like, okay, I won't check my pulse in your class anymore. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> making her nervous. So uh, any other questions? been on a job for a long time. Um, I guess what I'm asking is, I, I heard you say something that said that it, it, there's no real um, evidence with caffeine or that it might cause it. Yeah, and so. We've got a new generation, and like I'm guilty at work. I, I do my five or six cups of coffee a day, but I don't drink coffee usually on my days off, right? But what I know now is that we have a lot of young, I say young kids, even young adults, that, I mean, they're drinking those energy drinks nonstop like it's water. And we're talking three a day, right, on average. I mean, I'll sit at breakfast, and I'll look, and I'm drinking a cup of coffee, and I see all this at my crew with monsters and red bulls. And I'm noticing that we have guys that have fallen on fires because of increased heart rate. And we've seen guys burn out quicker when it comes to PT and training. So is there a link? I mean, is there something that shows that it might, that might be uh, some of the cause besides uh, our lack of sleep, how busy we are, you know, the energy. I mean, we were downtown for 15 plus years, you know what I mean? So is there something that? Uh, yeah. So, so the, or, the question is, uh, what is the link between uh, caffeine and and arrhythmias. Uh, the, the authors uh, cite studies that, they're, that it's basically inconclusive. That's basically what they're saying, that, that we don't know the answer to that. The, uh, the cardiologists that I both see, uh, I, I, so I have a regular cardiologist and an electrocardiopath, uh, the guy that does the surgery, and I've asked that same question to them, and their answer is some people can drink coffee and not have a problem, and other people, if they have one cup, it puts them into an arrhythmia. And so my, I think some people are more susceptible than others. And uh, if you're having problems, it's probably not good for you. So I definitely have moderated my, my caffeine consumption. I, I was the guy like you, six cups a day. And uh, now I'm two to four, four on a bad day. And I switch, try to switch to decaf. And so I, I keep my own decaf at the station and I'm constantly mixing up decaf crystals at the, at the station. So there's not really an answer yet. Depends on who you want to ask. Anything else? Cool. Thanks. Welcome back. Uh, up next, we're going to have Charlie uh, Gutierrez. He works for Foodie Fit. He's going to give us a brief rundown on some nutrition stuff. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, as Tony said, I'm Charlie from Foodie Fit. Uh, so just a little quick story on me, um, how I began, began my nutrition journey. Uh, I actually used to weigh 320 pounds when I was 16. Uh, so for me, it was just uh, pretty much saving my own life first. Uh, and being 16, you know, I was growing up around the era of technology, you know, our smartphones and computers. Uh, I never really had the courage to ask for the help, so I did it all by myself. Um, I've done every kind of diet. I've done all the, uh, the shortcuts. I've done the fentramine, all that stuff, the starving yourself. Um, so uh, it really took a toll on me, and I, I just couldn't understand why I couldn't keep the weight off. So that's what really, really pushed me to pursue studying nutrition. Um, so I, start, I just started studying online, just reading basic things on it. Started, you know, uh, use myself as a guinea pig. Everything I was reading, I was testing out, and whatever worked, I stuck with. Whatever didn't, I would take out. And uh, you know, the next steps I took was, you know, actually asking for help because I couldn't just do it myself. Um, so I hired like trainers and coaches and everything. But then I actually started going through. Uh, academies to be a certified nutrition coach. So currently I'm certified through Precision Nutrition. Um, they're one of the most renowned academies you can go through for nutrition learning. Um, they're very science-based, uh, which is what I love because most, most things about nutrition is very 
um, market ploy just to get you to buy their product and it doesn't really help. Um, I'm all about actually teaching people the right ways of having a good relationship with food and not treating it as something as bad uh, because we need food. You know, it's the energy we need, it's how we keep going, it's how we live day to day. Uh, and so when you cut one of those things out, it's, uh, it comes full circle. It'll start to affect everything else. You know? So you gotta find that balance with everything. Um, so that's what, I, what really helped me was actually tracking my macros, you know, your protein, carbs, and fats, making sure I was getting a good balance of a little bit of all of them uh, based on my goals. Um, from there, I actually dabbled with uh, the, the bodybuilding side. I competed. It was fun, um, not a career. Uh, that, talking to those people behind the stage, listening to the things they were doing, uh, the constant fighting for an image, and you were never happy with how you looked. I realized that even being at the peak of my physical appearance, <laughs> I was still chasing some sort of image and body dysmorphia. So really what I, what I really shifted my, my, my view on health is, you know, just under being, having a good relationship with food. It's not about how you look physically. It's really about on the inside. Like I want to be able to bend over without feeling back pain. I don't want to have uh, knee pain just from sitting down for 30 minutes. You know, that to me is unhealthy. Uh, but back to nutrition, um, you know, that's the biggest important thing and being, you know, a firefighter, you guys are very on the go. You guys are working 48, 72 hours. And um, from what I've seen, from what I've talked, from the people I've talked to in the academies um, and here in Vegas, uh, it's hard for you guys to really get that good meal in because you guys are always on the go. You, get, you guys get calls back and forth. So, uh, you know, that's pretty much what I'm going to be going over is pretty much helping you guys helping you all figure out, one, where your caloric intake should be, whether you're on shift or off shift, uh, some strategies to help you make sure you're staying fueled for your shifts, um, as well as uh, your food choices um, when it comes to getting simple sugars in, you know, something that's fast acting because being on the job, I've seen that you guys really don't know when you're gonna get the next call, how long you're gonna be out for, so it's very important that you're as fueled as possible because you don't know how long your duration is gonna be out there on the field. Um, so when it comes to calculating your intake, I actually use a formula. Uh, I have it here on my PowerPoint, but you guys won't be able to see it. Um, pretty much I take your body mass, your fat mass, your age, activity factor, some other variables to really get a baseline of where you should be um, and use that as my benchmark to really put, you base, put your intake based on your goal or you know, your career field. So uh, when it comes to your activity factor, as it was stated earlier, um, you guys are on that endurance athlete side. So I treat firefighters as such, endurance athletes. Um, so pretty much I try to teach, you know, strategy, uh, uh, strategies on top, of, uh, on top of like carb loading or just really knowing how to get um, your calories worth in such a small sitting. Um, oops, excuse me, my phone. There we go. And so when it comes to being on shift and making sure you get the proper nutrition you need as quick as you can, there's a couple things you can do. Um, but first, you know, I want to talk about your macro breakdown. I typically, with most clients I've worked with that are firefighters, I put their protein at a 20% intake, uh, their carbs between 50 to 65%, and their fats between 15 to 30%. Um, and also depending on your work volume, I set two different goals based on moderate volume of your workload and also heavy volume. So if you're on the moderate side, this is something you're gonna have to play with yourself. It's situational based. But if, you're, if you know you have like a very moderate workload from day to day, or you can predict how your workload's gonna be, if you have a moderate work day, um, I would suggest adding another 1,000 to 1,500 calories on top of your basal metabolic rate. So pretty much that's like your maintenance caloric intake. For example, if, you know, if your BMR you calculate comes out to 2,000 calories, I would want you to add at least 1,000 to 1,500 to that. So your intake would actually be 3,000 to 3,500, um, again, when you're on shift. Uh, the reason being is because, again, you need a lot of energy when you're out there. You don't know how long you're gonna be on the field. You don't know what you're gonna be into. So my, my ultimate goal is to make sure you're as fueled as possible so you don't fatigue really quick and it puts you in a bad spot to where, you know, like it was stated earlier, you could pass out. Um, so being fueled to the best of your ability is my biggest goal for you guys. Um, for a heavy volume day, I typically set, I typically add another 2,000, 2,500 calories on top of your maintenance calories. So uh, using that 2,000 benchmark, that's 4,000 to 4,500 calories a day. Um, and why is this? Well, because one, 
you know, as I, as I stated, I teach you guys as endurance, endurance athletes. You guys are going out for long, uh, prolonged periods of time, carrying a lot of extra gear on you. You don't know if you're gonna be helping people, carrying them, who knows what. So it's all about making sure you have those energy reserves that keep going throughout your day. Um, and, it's, and it's also important to make sure that you just have that fuel, because again, uh, it's gonna be very, uh, play a huge factor when you're out there in the field. And another, another little tip and trick that I teach is that if you pair a carbohydrate dense meal with some healthy fats, you can get away with a fat, a carb sparing effect uh, because of those healthy fats, your body will actually use those fats first as energy. So you don't really diminish your glycogen stores in your muscles. Um, so that's another trick I, I add in there um, that I teach. And so now for your off shift, off shift intakes, um, this is where the biggest thing happens is that this is the outside realm of where you should be practicing those healthy lifestyle choices. You know, making sure your health is still being uh, top of mind, getting your exercise in, making good food choices, um, but the intake will drop. So for an off shift intake, you know, on your days off, your rest days, you know, I always recommend dropping it back down to your maintenance calories. And then your macro breakdown would be 20 to 30% protein, your carbs 45 to 55%, and then your fats 15 to 35%. Um, and then, you know, during these off days, these rest days, you're eating for your health. You know, you wanna make sure you're focusing on building better habits, uh, work on your health goals. So if you're looking to build muscle or lose weight, this would be the time to do it. I wouldn't recommend focusing on your health goals while you're on shift, uh, just because the time won't be there for you to really focus on those health goals because you have to be so focused on the job at hand, the task at hand. Uh, so take advantage of your rest days, really focus on your health goals, not during your work shifts. And then some strategies to keep you ready um, is meal timing is a big thing, you know, endurance athletes use, uh, I've used in the past. So one thing you can do is like have a big breakfast if you can, you know, if there's nothing going on in the morning, it's pretty quiet. Try to have a bigger breakfast than usual. Um, this way your body's storing all of it and you'll have that energy ready and available for you later in your day for when it's really needed. Um, and if that food volume is too much, uh, look to do a smoothie. Um, one big thing I, I study is enzymes and, uh, and digestion. So if you, want a, if you want something to be more quickly active and readily available to your body, you're gonna want something in liquid form. Uh, so a smoothie would be your best bet. And another cool thing about the smoothie is that you can jam pack it with as much calories as you want and it's easy to drink. So if you know that you are in a station that's very high volume work pace, you really don't have time to get three, four meals in a day, um, a smoothie would be your best friend because again, you just jam pack it with calories and your body won't take as long to digest it because it's a liquid form compared to a solid form and liquids are quicker and easy, easy to digest. Um, and if that doesn't work, I would suggest carb loading. So after your work day is pretty much done, you have your dinner, I would always recommend having a bigger dinner then. So that way the next day you're prepared for everything. Um, and then also consuming simple sugars. So I'll be talking about some simple sugar food choices you can get uh, in the next slide. Um, but that's another big thing you're gonna wanna utilize is making sure you're getting a lot of simple sugar food sources in because simple sugars, they're in its simplest form and your body digests it quicker and it's more readily available. And then another thing is, um, you know, foodie fit, meal prepping, uh, you know, having something prepared, because I know cooking takes a lot of time, so there's always having something in the fridge that you just gotta pop, them, pop in the microwave um, would be a good tool to utilize as well. And so when it comes to food choices, some simple sugars you're gonna go with are like some white bread and pastas, uh, fruit, honey, and sports drinks. Um, the sports drinks, I would limit. Um, don't want you to drink all your calories from sports drinks, uh, and all that sugar intake isn't really good, but it's beneficial for you guys on your work shift days because it's, again, it's liquid form. So it'll just pass right through you. Your body will absorb it. It's ready to go. Um, on your off days, I would say if you still want to do your sports drinks or any other kind of like pop or anything like that, just do zero sugar. You know, you don't have to go cold turkey and, and remove it entirely. Just do like zero sugar alternatives. And then when it comes to like healthy fats to like pack in there, uh, make sure you're using things like avocado, or avocado oil, um, MCT oil, extra virgin olive oil, uh, chia seed, peanut butter, almond, almond butter, even dark chocolate. 
And for like a smoothie recipe, um, one I, I used to do a lot was about one to two cups of frozen berries, uh, one scoop of protein powder, half or a whole banana, um, one to two tablespoons of peanut butter, almond butter, and one to two ounces of chia seeds. So that was like my go-to, pretty good utilization if you need something quick, energy on the go. Um, and that's pretty much all I have. Uh, you know, so hopefully, I hope all the information helps. I feel like I ran through that pretty quick. Um, but I also just wanted to keep this simple and things that you guys can really just know where to get it, how to get it. And, you know, it's just not, it's not as complicated as it may, you may think. But the most important thing is just that I want to touch on is just knowing your caloric intake and just making sure you're not underfeeding so you don't hurt yourself out there and, you know, put yourself in a bad position. Any questions? So you're after a peanut butter? Huh? Yeah, okay. Questions. Uh, do you have a certain amount of meals that you prescribe per day? Um, no, it's all dependent, you know, but for you guys, you know, it, it would vary. So the question was, do I recommend any certain meals per day? No, uh, because everyone's lifestyle is different. Everyone's job's different. Everyone has different amounts of time to really sit down and eat a meal. So, you know, using you guys as an example, as firefighters on your work days, you don't have that time. So that's why I would, I would recommend you guys eating bigger meals as soon as you can, because you, you can't predict your day, it's unpredictable. But at least you know you got a bulk of your calories in, you're not gonna be hurting out there later on. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Thanks for uh, sticking around. Our next presenter is Jason Warren. He's going to be talking about some nutrition aspects too. So, All right. How's everyone doing? Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about exercise, nutrition, and some sleep. Um, so as some of our previous presenters talked about, cardiovascular disease is a big issue, not only worldwide, but also especially within the fire department. Um, so we'll be talking a little bit about planning your exercise, planning your nutrition, um, and getting sufficient sleep to mitigate that risk. Um, to start, I would like participation from everyone in the room and anyone who's watching uh, behind the camera. Um, go ahead and raise your hand if you engage in regular physical exercise. Everyone in the room, keep your hand raised. Now, keep your hand raised only if that exercise is planned. You track your volume and your intensity in some sort of journaling. Lots of hands went down. Cool, we got some left up. Keep your hand raised if you follow a healthy diet. Uh, don't put your hand back up if you already dropped it. You're out. <laughs> okay, so keep your hand raised if you track macros, calories, you journal, you track your weight. Oh, Morgan's only left. And go ahead and put your hands down if you do not get enough sleep every night. You do not get a consistent eight hours of sleep. Why am I the only one in the room with my hand up? That's a problem, okay? So, we are going to talk about planning, periodization uh, for firefighter health and performance. Um, so, our agenda today is the associated job risks, planning, exercise, periodization, nutrition, and sleep schedule. Cardiovascular disease uh, accounts for 30% of on-duty fatalities among firefighters over the past 10 years. This is in the form of cardiac arrest, uh, and that's gonna arise from hypertension, atherosclerosis, and uh, stress, both acute and chronic. Um, firefighters with sleep disorders are also 2.4 times more likely to have CVD, 1.9 times more likely to have diabetes, and three times more likely to have depression and anxiety, and we can assume how that might impact the previous. So, prevention. Prepare like an athlete, right? So our first pre presenter talked about these numbers in terms of athletes and related to that, that to firefighters. So this is gonna be important, right? Um, so how, to how do athletes prepare? Planned exercise, planned nutrition, and planned sleep. So how can we plan our exercise, right? You know, it's common in today's industry to pick the best exercises, pick the best type of training. But once we do that, how do we organize it, right? So 
in exercise science, we do that through what we call exercise periodization. This is what all athletes do, whether they realize it or not, their strength coaches are periodizing, the, periodizing their training in a way that they're going to peak their performance when they need to, they're going to recover appropriately, and it's going to match the way their nutrition is currently, depending on what season it is or what, what time in the week it is, when their next event is. So for an athlete, in season, they're gonna perform once a week, a couple times a week, if, if it's a, a, a higher frequency game day uh, sport. You guys are going to be performing at a moment's notice many times a week, especially if you work overtime, right? So we should periodize, periodize our training to perform well when you're supposed to, which as we know, you may not know when that is. Um, fatigue management, we talked about inflammation and how that's going to uh, affect your heart, cardiovascular markers, diabetes, um, and these things that we have established is a big problem in the fire department, okay? So, you have a high stress job. If your training is high stress, as it should be because we have to prepare to perform, we cannot constantly perform at a high level in training and then expect to perform at a high level on the job, right? So to avoid plateaus, to avoid injury, and to uh, avoid overtraining, we need to start structuring our training in a manner to where we can uh, perform well and not burn out. So how do we periodize? periodize? Macro cycles, meso cycles, and micro cycles. And so that's going to be segmenting your year to months to weeks and into your daily cycles using a principle of specificity to decide what forms of trainings do we need to perform our best um, and, and continue to build upon the skills that we need to perform on the job, right? And then how do we progress that? Objective and subjective feedback. What's objective feedback? Volume, intensity, and technique. These are the clear physical markers and the data markers that we can look at to say, hmm, training's been feeling bad, I feel fatigued, and these markers are higher than before. Let's change them. Subjective feedback, fatigue, motivation, and recovery. When you start feeling that fatigue, when you feel less motivated for your next workout, and when you're not recovering by your next shift or by your next workout, we know it's time to make a change. And consider your nutritional intake for each of these phases before engaging in your highest intensity block or low intensity block. We need to match the two. So types of fatigue, we have local. So that's gonna be muscle, connective tissue, so your peripheral nervous system. This could be anything as simple as doing bicep curls. You're not gonna be able to do another set after sufficient recovery. If you had a leg day, you're probably not gonna have an effective leg day the day after leg day, right? Simple. Systemic fatigue. So, central nervous system. You're getting a big dump of hormones. You're getting a big dump of adrenaline when you do these big exercises like deadlift, like squat, and they're very heavy, high intensity, or high intensity interval training, or high intensity cardiovascular training, right? They talked about uh, the inflammatory cytokines. This is a response that we get not only when we're sick, but also when we overtrain, right? This is why often when you have a week of hard training, you will often feel kind of sick, right? We have those inflammatory markers, which to a degree are very good because we need that for recovery. However, we need to mitigate that, right? We also have a degree of psychological fatigue that is also systemic. You know, we talked about not hitting numbers. You don't feel as good at the gym. You don't feel as good on the job. And that's gonna lead to a little bit of depression and stress, right? So avoid burnout with periodization and utilizing maintenance phases. Two to four weeks post cycle, make training fun, um, and drop your total volume and intensity to a reasonable amount to provide recovery. So types of periodization. We have a linear. We increase variables week by week with scheduled deloads. This is what most people are gonna gain a lot of benefit from, and from beginners to intermediates. Um, eventually, especially for athletes and for people like you, 
we're going to need to get into more advanced versions of periodization. We have block training. This is phasic training with each block focusing on building upon a last skill and building upon the next, right? So this is usually in the goal of peaking for, for a, a, an event uh, or, or, you know, uh, performing well uh, at the end of that phase. So we then have daily undu undulating and weekly undulating periodization. These are changes in volume, either uh, any, any variable, volume or intensity daily to adjust for periods of time when you need to peel back on training. Um, we could do weekly. Um, we can have high intensity week, low intensity week, and alternate to, right? So for you guys, how can this be applicable? So if you have 48 on, 96 off, right? You shouldn't make your highest intensity training days on your 48 hour shift or right before for that matter. So a possible solution would be making your harder training days, you know, in the middle of your days off, tapering training, and then building back up when you get off shift again. This is harder for those of you who work overtime. Um, but point being, you do need to start uh, organizing your training in a manner to where you will not overtrain and not end up on the job without the energy to perform. So moving into nutrition. Um, I organize the importance of nutrition in a pyramid, right? At the bottom of your pyramid, we have calorie balance. So calorie balance is going to be king. This is going to be what stops you from gaining or losing weight. Um, then we have macros. Macros, we're going to adjust those different categories. Um, and that will then set up the precedent for our next category, the micros. Micromolecules being vitamins, minerals, probiotics, prebiotics, these kinds of things. That typically falls in line after we get our macros together. However, if we do notice deficiencies there, we should address them. And at the top of our pyramid, we have what is probably most often overemphasized, um, but realistically the things of least importance, is timing and supplementation, right? So calorie balance. We do calculate with a simple formula. You can find this online. Um, you don't really want to do the math yourself because it's a long, obnoxious formula. But it is the total daily energy expenditure. And with this, you should establish a plus or minus 500 calorie per day to either gain weight, if that's your goal, or lose weight, if that's your goal. And fat loss will be um, productive to improving these cardiovascular markers. So once you have established your daily intake, I urge you to start tracking your weight. This is gonna be the only way you're going to know the calorie balance that you established is doing what it's supposed to. All the formulas in the world aren't going to guess what each individual needs. So you use that formula to establish your baseline and then we go ahead and track daily weight to monitor ourselves um, and then make our uh, changes accordingly. So typical weight loss rates are 0.5 to 1% of body weight. Weight gain phases are similar. We do this because we don't want to be into excessive a deficit, especially for you firefighters, because you need your energy. Um, and weight gains, we don't want to put on too much fat. So for those of you who have gotten into a bulk phase and you gained 20 pounds in a month, that's cool, but that's mostly fat. We do not gain enough muscle at quick enough rate to warrant that much um, weight gain. So then we get to the diet after the diet, right? You've lost all the fat that you need to, now what? Well, we need to get into repair mode. We need to start adding calories back slowly but surely um, because we can't sit in a deficit forever, right? Um, so. The diet after the diet is one of the most important things, in my opinion, um, because we constantly hear about people losing weight. They're not able to keep it off. They rebound and they gain more weight than ever before. Right. So manage it. And then once we get to the point where we have lost enough fat, let's slowly build up and progress in the same way we we, we drop the fat off. Uh, 
to enter this maintenance phase, right? So macronutrients in general, our distribution range, 10 to 35% of protein is going to have the highest thermic effect of food. Um, so I typically re recommend a higher than usual uh, protein intake, um, air on that side, because you will get more energy expended from food than any other macro. Carbs, 45 to 65%. Um, you are going to be treating yourselves as athletes, so you do need to be getting your carbs in. Carbs are linked to high performance um, in athletes, pre-exercise, um, and we need to keep that up even during fat loss phases for you guys. Uh, fat, 20 to 35%. This is the lowest thermic effect of food, so for my clients, I do drop fat as low as acceptable. What is acceptable? Minimum of 0.5 grams to one gram per kilo. Is, seems to be what is acceptable to maintain your hormone balance. Carbs emphasize those near training and protein. You should be getting somewhere between 1.6 to 2.4 grams per kilo as recommended for athletes. And again, we are considering you guys athletes. So carbs and performance, 30 to 60 grams per hour uh, of exercise. You'll take that shortly before um, or during prolonged exercise. Um, this is especially important for moderate to high intensity exercise, um, which you guys are going to need to continue to establish to maintain your levels of fitness and you're going to be using on the job. Fiber, this is going to be associated with a significant reduction in total and LDL cholesterol. So do not skip out on your fiber, make sure you're getting enough of that. And so long as you're focusing on a, um, a well-rounded diet, you should be getting those through your carbohydrate intake. Um, and it also has another high thermic effect of food compared to fats. All right, so fats, although um, they are going to be our lowest percentage, they do have a significant impact on CVD, right? So maintaining fewer than 7% of your calories from saturated fats and little to no trans fats. I'm gonna say that little to no trans fats, they are worth nothing. So keeping those things in that range, as well as keeping approximately five to 10% of your fats from polyunsaturated and 15 to 20% of your uh, fats from monounsaturated, all have a positive impact on heart health, right? Omega-3 fatty acids, we get that from fish. I know a lot of people don't like fish, either get over it or find a different food choice, which could be in the forms of chia seeds. Um, that is a good plant option that I use for clients who do not want to eat the fish. Um, or you can use an omega-3 supplement, although not as good as food, it can get the job done. And although a, uh, an adequate intake has not been established, um, most organizations do recommend between up to 250 and 500 milligrams of those omega-3s daily for heart health. Micronutrients, again, I wouldn't overstress this category so long as you're nailing your calories, hit your macros through a balanced diet, this should fall in line, and consuming anti antioxidant rich foods like fruits and whole grains have been shown to have a huge impact on heart health. Um, supplements do not seem to have that same impact. So you can't just take a pill for everything, right? Um, and that's usually because of the profile of each food, right? You're not only getting that specific micromolecule, molecule, you are getting a cascade of micromolecules and macromolecules, which aid in the digestion and absorption of each other, right? So aim for whole foods if you can and supplement only when necessary. Plant stanols and sterols, they mimic cholesterol and bind to the receptors, um, which means cholesterol no longer can uh, bind to those receptors and uptake into the bloodstream. So, bloodstream. So, plant sandals and sterols, mega important. And so long as you're getting your veggies in, in whatever way you can, um, I would shoot for that, right? So, timing. Again, this is of lesser importance than the rest of the things we talked about, but timing does have a place. So, we talked about um, meal frequency, how many meals in a day. I would use some of these uh, strategies to establish that. Um, the only thing I emphasize from a meal timing perspective is protein. 
So you should space out protein feedings evenly throughout the day, typically in a window of approximately three to six hours apart. This is due to muscle protein synthesis, right? We want to maintain muscle mass due to its positive effects on cardiovascular disease um, and your job performance, right? So we want to stimulate muscle protein synthesis as often as possible. So once you establish your protein, we are now going to split that amongst your meals about three to six hours apart. For those who are dieting down, I would re recommend on the lower end of that. And for those who are of higher muscle mass, further to the lower end of that, because you likely, although we don't have the studies yet, you likely will need that protein in larger amounts or more often. So 0.4 grams of protein per kilo per meal is the typical suggestion. And if you are spacing your total uh, protein intake accordingly, you should nail that. And again, for those of us who are higher muscle mass, we may need a little bit more than that, and it's no problem if you err on that side. Carbs near training or the event for performance. That is the only thing when it comes to carb timing. Outside of that, have them whenever you want. Fats I typically shuffle towards early and late in the day simply for feelings of satiety, especially on diet because you're gonna get hungry. So I shuffle them towards those ends of the day so that you feel like you're still full. Right? All right, so the rest is preference. Optimal is not always optimal. If you do not like the spacing of your current meal intake, change it, because I'd rather you get your food in than not. So this is gonna be especially important for you guys on the job and off. Supplements, again, of least importance, but there are some we should pay attention to. Creatine, one of the most widely studied supplements we have. Very positive for performance, modest, 2%-ish improvement in your sports performance. The typical uh, recommendations are 10 to 20 grams per day during a loading week, and then three to five grams per day for maintenance. After that, we have caffeine. So current caffeine recommendations for performance is three to six milligrams per kilo. And I would use that per person based on your tolerance with caffeine. Um, and history of use with caffeine. And for you guys especially, I would err on the side of caution um, and monitor that intake due to your significant uh, risk for CVD, cardiac arrest, um, and the issues that many of the presenters have already highlighted. Protein supplement, as needed. You don't have to, but if you can't get your food in, protein supplement. Omega-3 fish oil, if you refuse to eat fish, <laughs> and if you can't get it in, in the form of uh, any other food, however, I would urge you to try to. And then a multivitamin I like as a coverall, right? It's cheap, so why not? It's not gonna hurt you. And we get to the, my favorite part today. So in working with many of you so far, a lot of you do well with training. A lot of you do well with nutrition to the best of your ability. No one gets sleep. And interestingly, interestingly enough, we have a study here showing that people who do not get adequate sleep have similar insulin resistance and increased glucose to those that have established diabetes. Problematic, right? What mechanisms could this be? Hormones, hormone disruption through lack of sleep, reduced skeletal muscle mass and increased fat mass through lack of sleep. We'll get to that in a second. And increased caloric intake because when you do not sleep enough, you tend to overeat. So relative muscle mass is negatively associated with the development of type two diabetes. Note that resistance training causes molecular changes that may assist with increased glucose uptake and improving insulin sensitivity, ins insulin sensitivity likely due to the increased muscle mass because of that resistance training. So, lean body mass is associated with lower risk of major adverse cardiovascular events, which we talked about before, is your current leading cause of death on the force. How do we mitigate that? What does this have to do with sleep? Well, here in this study, we have a group of 8.5 hours of sleep and a group of 5.5 hours of sleep, both engaging in a fat loss program. Both lost the same amount of weight. The group that got less sleep lost significantly more in muscle mass on the same diet with less sleep. The group that got sufficient sleep lost very little in lean muscle mass in, or yes, lost very little in lean muscle mass and significant amount of the weight lost was 
fat mass. So that's going to be, again, important when referencing our cardiovascular numbers and our diabetes numbers. So some strategies you guys use that I have currently witnessed in, in coaching a few of you guys. You have your 48 hours on, we'll just make up for it, right? On our days off, catch up on sleep. Well, we got a study here that compared caloric rest restriction for weight loss with people getting consistent sleep each night and those who restricted sleep on some nights and caught up on others. They had the same weekly total sleep. Well, 39% of the weight loss was lean body mass in the sleep restricted group, while only 17% was lean body mass in the group that got enough sleep. So it doesn't seem that we can just catch up, right? We cannot just catch up on sleep. We have to work on getting through a full sleep cycle and, and using strategies to, to manipulate our sleep in ways that we no longer are at risk for, for, for these problems that are majorly associated with a lack of sleep, right? Inadequate sleep is also associated with an increased risk for CVD, increased risk in those pro-inflammatory cytokines that we are trying to mitigate through both nutrition and program periodization. However, we're clearly seeing that if we combine both of those great strategies with a lack of sleep, we're banging our head against the wall and hoping we're gonna get through, right? Lower leptin le levels and increased ghrelin levels. These are hunger regulation hormones. This is, this is why those who get a lack of sleep typically overeat. Risk of depression and anxiety, also going to impact those in inflammation markers, as well as um, some of those uh, risk factors for suicide. Cognitive function and memory, as well as decision-making. This is going to go back to on-the-job performance. If we are not getting adequate sleep, on-the-job performance will suffer. Um, so if you do want the link to this, all of the studies are referenced here at the end of the PowerPoint. Um, and feel, reach, feel free to reach out for those references. Um, but I would like to leave you with one more concluding statement, and that is that I have witnessed a lot of you guys making a genuine effort to improve your health by hiring coaches, hiring nutritionists, and doing everything you can, following a lot of these strategies to improve your health and your performance on the job. The one area of improvement that I cannot fix, all I can do is say, get better sleep, right? You guys cannot fix because you have to perform when you're asked to perform. So this isn't an appeal to the firefighters that are doing their job. This is an appeal to those of you in a management position, those of the, you that can make a schedule change, those of you that can make positive changes in the department to improve sleep. I don't have the answers because I don't know your, your, your hierarchy. I don't know your management. Um, and I don't know how, how we can improve that, but I would love to talk to someone about it. I would love to reference these studies. Um, however, I would reference some of the studies done from NASA on napping. They have probably the most groundbreaking research on sleep. Um, and we know why it's NASA and they need to perform as well, right? So we should take a note out of their book. We should take a note on improving sleeping quarters, whether that may be um, uh, blackout rooms, isolated rooms so that you are not interrupted during your sleep, possible implementation of some kind of napping schedule while on the job, and possibly some kind of uh, a relief program for on-duty firefighters who have not gotten that consistent amount of sleep because it sure does seem that while we try to do all that we can through exercise and nutrition, and I do urge that you do that because a lot of you dropped your hands right before I got to sleep anyways, um, I, do, I do urge someone with the power to make change at a department-wide level uh, to improve those sleeping uh, patterns, those, that sleep quality, um, and the general department um, uh, efforts around sleep. Uh, any questions? So, so eating, yes. So 
I, I do like the previous referenced uh, split day eating plan, um, shuffling a little bit more calories um, to your day of eating um, and or, or shuffling a little bit more ca calories to your day of work and shuffling a little bit less to your days off. However, that is not always conducive to someone's schedule. And I would lean towards preference mostly when establishing your daily intake of calories. Um, again, focus on those calories, then the macros, then the specifics. Um, so a typical day while on the job could look like pretty hectic. <laughs> In my experience with you guys, you're trying to figure out, you're trying to do as much as you can. So strategies would be bringing meals um, as well as promoting a different culture around the firehouse, right? I know you guys are faced with constant choices of donuts and homemade meals and things that people bring in because that's fun and that's, you know, that's your guys' culture. But we should promote um, a little bit more acceptance of those that are trying to improve their markers through nutrition. Um, and on those days off, nail it. Nail it as much as you can because that's going to be when you have your most time to focus on that. Um, and really organize it uh, according to your lifestyle at the end of the day. Sweet. So we're, we're back. Uh, up next is uh, Captain Jason Calhoun, who is going to cover um, cancer awareness. So for as long as I can remember, I've always wanted to be a firefighter. It started being born in New York and then being raised in LA. When I was in LA, we were right next to a fire station. And every time the sirens went off, I ran to the door and I ran outside and sometimes I even chased them. Uh, I was very excited about being a firefighter my entire life. In fact, every Christmas, every birthday gift and anytime anybody ever gave me a gift, I got a fire engine or a ladder truck. That's how passionate about firefighting I was. I absolutely loved it. I knew that it was something that I wanted to do. Moving forward, uh, we, I started as a LA City Fire Explorer because I got a chance to go to that fire station and talk to them about it. Um, they said, hey, we got a program. I lied about my age because I was only 13 at the time and you had to be 14. I got in and I was there for two months and I was so passionate and so excited about the opportunity Then my mom came up to me and said, Jason, we're moving to Tucson. I had no clue where Tucson, Arizona was. The good news is that when I finally moved to Tucson, I found another fire department that had the same opportunity and I started as a fire explorer there. I was a fire explorer for uh, four years and then I got hired at the young age of 18. I had gone through my EMT basic my last semester in high school and I had a contingent job offer so long as I passed high school. The tricky part was that I almost didn't pass high school because of my EMT basics. So that was tough enough as it is. But I got hired and I was pretty much raised in the fire service. I spent uh, seven years there before I had the opportunity, as you can see behind me, to get hired by Las Vegas Fire. Little did I know though, is that my passion in firefighting would expose me to one of the worst things that ever happened to me in my life, and that was cancer. At the young age of 32, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor and it was a rare form of brain tumor called clival cordoma. The incidence is less than one in a million. I couldn't have won the lottery, right? But I won a brain tumor. I will tell you that now, 13 years in the survivorship, it truly was the best thing that ever happened to me. It completely changed me and refocused me. But today, I'm here talking to all of you about the importance of cancer in the fire service because it is truly an epidemic right now. It is actually exceeding cardiac problems and only close uh, second next to cancer is PTSD and suicide in the fire service. As you can see, my, I'm one of eight and my brothers and one sister who isn't up there, we're pretty much all look the same. We're half Irish, we're half Scottish. We pretty much all have the same haircut except for one that's in denial. Um, and we all have the same body type. But in 2008, where my story started was after about a four year battle of end stage COPD and being a lifelong smoker, my dad finally passed away and died. It was at the funeral 
where all of us half Scottish and half Irish guys were getting together and drinking up that I was having the worst headaches of my entire life. I had never had headaches in my life and I never understood what that was. And I was kind of in denial about it for a little bit until I came home and I was working on a unit where the captain was a physician assistant and a paramedic. The engineer was a paramedic. I was a paramedic and my partner was a, a BSN, a nurse and, and soon to be paramedic. And I was telling them that I was having headaches and pinpoint tenderness behind my right eye. Everybody at the same time said, we need to go to the hospital. We need to go get an MRI. See at Las Vegas fire at the time, we had a massive cl cancer cluster. Between 2005 and 2009, we had multiple cancers all at once. And to this day, we still don't know what that came from, but I was part of that. This right here behind me is my, my brain tumor. His name's Phil. He's not actually the picture of my uh, brain tumor, but this is who I used to, to kind of distance myself from the fact that I had a brain tumor. Had surgery and was diagnosed that following January after my father's funeral awake, and indeed I did have cancer. Hearing the words, Jason, you have cancer, were the worst words that I'd ever heard in my entire life. And in fact, for anybody or anybody that I mentor now with the Cancer Support Network, it is the hardest thing to hear and to absorb. Part of it's denial. It's denial that I'm 32 years old, I'm relatively healthy, and now I have a brain tumor? How did that happen? I work out. I, I of course, I occasionally go out and have a little drink, but I eat healthy. And I do what I'm supposed to do at work, work out, and then at off duty, I work out as well. How am I 32 years old, I don't have any kids yet, I'm not married yet, and I have cancer? How is that possible? How is it possible that I'm 32 with a rare form of brain tumor where the incidence is one in a million? How did that happen to me? And in my journey in the last 13 years, and now being with the Firefighter Cancer Support Network as the Southern Nevada director, Assistant Director and a cancer coach and mentor for them, we're starting to see and understand our data a little bit better. And that's what I'm gonna present with you guys today because it truly is an epidemic and a huge problem. So cancer is the most dangerous, unrecognized threat to the health and safety of our, of our firefighters. It's the number one cause of firefighter line of duty deaths, according to the IFF. This data has been out there for a long time. In 2013, the Firefighter Cancer Support Network got a grant and we published a white paper that was crystal clear in showing almost without reasonable doubt that we have an epidemic problem in the fire service and it's cancer. In 2007, the World Health Organization the International Agency for Research on Cancer, the working group classified cancer as possibly carcinogenic to humans and called for more research and understanding. They listed it as a group 2B. Group four means that it's probably not uh, carcinogenic at all. Group one, that it absolutely is. Well, June 30th of this year, they changed their standing based on 52 different research studies and cohorts and they listed it as absolutely carcinogenic for firefighters. That's big news in the fire service. Now we can say without a doubt that being a firefighter, being around smoke, you are around carcinogens and you are increasing your risk of cancer. 40% of the general population will be diagnosed with cancer. 9% of firefighters have a higher risk of being uh, diagnosed. So simply just being a firefighter increases your risk by 9%. 14%. Firefighters have a 14% higher morbidity rate than the general population because of that. You still don't believe me? I want you to look at this graph behind us. Some of us have been to Colorado Springs and we've seen that wall and we've stood in that, that amazing memorial that's out there. 67% of the firefighters that are on the wall there at the IFF Fallen Firefighters Memorial between 2002 and 2020 have all died from cancer. Not heart disease, not fire and smoke, from cancer. It's not that heart disease isn't important in the fire service because it absolutely is. And what leads to that is also a lack of sleep. And we'll talk more about why that's important for cancer too. But this is crystal clear that this is an epidemic in the fire service. The data, you, you can't disprove the data. It's pretty much there. 
If you look at since 2002, if you look at those, uh, the IFF database, and even if you're not a statistical genius, if you look at the, at the uh, blue versus uh, orange up there, the blue is the, the cancer incidence, and that cancer incidence for firefighters is way higher than the general population, just simply for doing our jobs day in and day out. And see, you don't even have to be on a fire to be exposed to those carcinogens. The carcinogens that we bring back in our calves and in our turnouts, they're still latent. They're still around us. You can still be exposed to cancer and not physically even been on a fire. If we're not using the plymo vents that we have and when we back up, that diesel goes right on our turnouts whether we're at work or not, and then we put those turnouts on and we go to work and we're exposed. It's out there. So why is that? because there's over 200 known chemicals that cause cancer. And some of those are listed behind me. That's a lot, a tremendous amount. Simply stated, where there's smoke, there is cancer. If you don't believe me and you still, still need more data, behind me is our Las Vegas Fire Department cancer list. The ones that are in yellow are the ones that died in the line of duty. Out of the nine line of duty deaths that we've had at Las Vegas Fire, six have been from cancer. Some of those names are right back on that wall right over behind you if you're in this room. This is only the published list of people that are willing to give me their names and their cancer type that's published up there. Some that aren't up there is another breast cancer, is another uh, skin cancer, and another uh, prostate uh, cancer. They just didn't want their names up there. And this is only a current list. This is a current list from 2002 to, to 2022, so basically 20 years. And there's a lot more up there than I think we think about. If you're watching this presentation right now and you're hearing me talk and you can't recognize a single one of those names because maybe you have less than five years on, I want you to hear me clearly on this. I was that person too at five years. And, and because you don't have a tangible relationship with these people, you think that it can't hurt you. You think that it's never gonna be you, but eventually, because we work 10, 20, and 30 years in time, your incidence of getting cancer will go up because of your exposure rate. In fact, the busier in the houses you are, and I've always been at busy houses too. I did my probation at three, I went to one, and I went back to three for five and a half years until I came down with my battle and I needed to tap out. The more times you're going on fires, the more times that you're coming back and not changing your gear, washing your helmet, washing your mask, hooking up the plymo vent, the more times you're not actually showering within the hour of being back, your cancer incidence is going through the roof. And these are simple, simple things that we can do. They're not very hard at all. In 2015, the IFF helped us uh, in creating a, a fluorescent aerosol screening test. And as you can see behind me is the firefighter before he puts on his gear. As you can see, it's typical fluorescent. You don't see anything big back there. This is modern day firefighting equipment. He was then brought into a room to see how much of that actually penetrates our modern day firefighting equipment. And this was after the test. Anything that's lit up in that bright green is everything that got through. So that would have been the soot and smoke that got through our modern day firefighting equipment. As you can see, you look around the neck, that would be your thyroid and your skin cancers. You look around the ears and the back of the head and that whole head area, that's your exposure to brain cancer. You can see that there's hands and there's wrists and then moving forward down in the gear, the lower legs and the thighs. That's even today with modern firefighting. So simply stated for every five degree increase in skin temperature, there's up to a 400% increase in skin absorption. That's dramatically high. We don't really understand that until we get into that. And so how can we make changes about this, right? It comes down to culture. But before I get into that, how many times have we been around some old timer that tells us you look stupid wearing your mask at a trash fire or in a dumpster fire or in a car fire? Unfortunately, those are the incidents where you're getting the most exposure because we run on them the most. We run on those dumpster fires, those trash fires and those car fires. That's when we should be doing it the most. And in terms of a dumpster fire, think about everything, especially in the downtown area that somebody throws into a dumpster. You're being exposed to all kinds of stuff, batteries, diapers. We, we could go quite on for a while there. So what can we do? There's modifiable risk factors. Obviously, 
really taken a, a leap forward and kind of reducing our tobacco use. If you're a smoker, you're a chewer, you're increasing your risk of cancer by being a tobacco user. Limiting our alcohol intake. And part of this conversation you've heard from the other presenters, obviously eating healthy. That's a big one. Getting those green nutrients in there to get all those toxins out of you is super, super huge. Using sunscreen. Skin cancer is a lot more prevalent than people think out there. And then working out and staying fit. That's super important to, to have not only crews come together and work out, and everybody wants to work out a little differently and that's fine. All that we care about is that we get out there and we find a physical fitness routine at least once a day to do something. Whether it's cardio, strength, if it's getting on a rower, getting on an elliptical, if you're not much of a runner, I'm obviously not, but I'm a bit of a jogger and I enjoy that, mountain biking, whatever it takes. Just being active and going out there and doing that. This is kind of a new study and I want you to see that and it's gonna support everything that all of us talked about. So a stu study published in the Journal of Clinical Sleep Medicine investigated 7,000 firefighters in 66 fire departments for obstructive sleep disorders. And obviously researchers found that 37% were positive for at least one type of sleep disorder. That's relatively huge. But you're hearing me say the same thing that the pre presenters before me came from, how important sleep is, and it's huge. The study revealed more than 80% were positive for a common sleep disorder. So why is that important? Because in 1996, a researcher out of UCLA noticed, his name was Dr. Uh, Irwin, that 40%, sorry, 42 healthy men uh, that were kept awake between 10 p.m. and uh, 3 a.m. showed a 70% reduction in a, a cancer-fighting immune cell known as natural killers, those NK cells. Those NK cells float within our bodies and they literally have the ability to hunt down cancer cells and kill them. But sleep is so important to that. And the lack of sleep that we get in the fire service perpetuates those NK cells from not being there and not being healthy enough. Obviously, in knowing our hot and our warm and our cold zones, the closer we get to our hot zone and our IDLH areas, we need to be masked up. Where there's smoke, there's fire. Now at the same time, I'm not saying that you can't do your job and, and there are times where it's just not achievable to put on your mask at the right time, but for the most part, when we're in there and we see smoke, we should have our masks on. And that's important also for our engineers that may be at the pump panel without turnouts on, and for them to put on their air packs, even in that environment. But I wanna take it a step further. You saw the fluorescent test, even with your air pack on, you're still being exposed to a tremendous amount of your body and skin to that soot. And that soot is where cancer lays. So what can we do? Well, the good news at Las Vegas Fire and with the help of Local 1285, we have and are close to the top 1% of fire departments that have the ability to prevent this from happening just from the policies and procedures that have been put in. First thing you should do is when you come back from a fire, you should shower within the hour. Our company officers and our battalion chiefs need to make that a purposeful event for our firefighters. When you come back, you stay out of service, you go switch out your hoods, which is another huge benefit that we have, and you go shower and you take a hot shower that's pretty close to a sauna and we get that out of our out of our pores. That's phenomenal. Plymo vents. Plymo vents are huge, but how many of us have gone into a fire station and the Plymo vents not even connected, right? Multiple of us have. Now, there are times where the systems are down, but Las Vegas Fire and our local 1285 has worked really, really hard to get those in our fire stations. Diesel soot and exhaust has benzene in it. That is a known carcinogen, no doubt. That's been studied, that's been studied on mice, and it's absolutely true that if you're around diesel exhaust, you're gonna get that. So, the next thing is switching out our gear. Another thing that our department and our local 1285 has been good at is getting us a second set of gear. I need you to understand that less than 5%, less than, uh, let me rephrase that, Less than 0.05% of, of fire departments in America have two sets of gear. We have two sets of gear. But how many of us have come back with dirty gear and we don't change it out to get laundered? And what's even sillier about that is we don't even have to launder it ourselves. Most of us that started in the early fire service literally had to take our stuff off duty 
and go to a laundromat and wash our own gear. For us here at Las Vegas Fire, all we have to do is bag it up, fill out a tag, a cadet comes and picks it up, they launder it or repair it for us, and then we get it back. But yet we don't see people doing that. We don't see people switching out into their second set of gear. Last but not least is our helmets. I know the helmet is a badge of courage for a lot of firefighters, and part of that I'm not gonna be able to change. But if I could talk to the five or 10 year firefighter that's out there, don't end up with that dirty helmet. That dirty helmet that's full of soot and grit is a walking cancer stick that's on your head day in and day out. Some of our recent cancers that we found in skin cancer is right from where the brim of our helmet is because guys don't want to send in their helmets to ECMS annually to get washed and laundered. That is just absolutely silly. That should not be a badge of courage. And again, calling on the officers and the company officers within our fire stations, we need to remind guys when our helmets are getting a little out of control that we need to get those laundered. We talked about showering within the hour. I can't tell you how important that is alone. Um, and that would include in training. The OSB that we use at the training props and the roof prop, the glue that sticks it together is formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is a known carcinogen. When that sawdust and everything gets in the crevices of your eyes and up your nose, just know that you're being exposed to cancer. Am I telling you that we shouldn't go down and, and use OSB? Absolutely not. There's no better training prop than we have. And personally, I think that as for those of us that aren't truckies, we need to be on that, that roof prop even more. All I'm saying is be more purposeful about when you come back from training to get in the shower, or since we have the wipes in our, in our rig, Use the wipe, pick your nose in front of everybody, blow out all that, all, that, uh, all that sawdust, wipe your neck, wipe your head, wipe your face, and then when you get back, shower. And I can't tell you how important just showering to limit your exposure is. Um, in the fire stations, we were successful uh, as with the Firefighter Cancer Support Network and Local 1285 to get some of our ice machines moved. As you can see, this is where the, the biggest proof of evidence came from. I walked into station one and I took a scoop of ice in our tumbler and I put it on uh, one of our chief's desk at the time. And I said, let this melt. And I came back in a 15 minutes and we both looked inside and I said, you see that oil film that's in there? Yeah, what's that? That's the diesel soot that's coming from the emissions of our rigs. We need to enclose this ice machine that's inside of station one. Okay, that was a simple fix, and it was an easy thing to prove. We were successful at doing that in some of our legacy houses, and now with new research and design elements with our fire stations, all of our ice machines are now outside of the hot zone or where we keep apparatus and where we keep turnouts. Other big stuff. Um, obviously, no fire gear into our living quarters. I think we've been really good about that. We're posting those signs up there and making sure that nobody does that. Occasionally, we have somebody that makes a mistake and comes inside with that. And also with the support of our department, they've been phenomenal in allowing us to use uh, our tennis shoes inside of the living quarters and not taking our boots inside, which not only exposes us to carcinogens, but hepatitis, AIDS, herpes, and everything else that we're around. Um, there are 12 immediate actions to protect yourself as a firefighter. Number one, obviously, being using SCBA from uh, initial attack through overhaul, which is huge. It's different in overhaul if you have the sky above you and it's present, and I get that our air packs get heavy, especially towards the end of an incident, especially if you've been working really hard. But understand that even if you can't see smoke, doesn't mean that when you're overhauling that you don't have cancer present. And I'm not saying that that always needs to happen, but taking a, a monitor in there and monitoring for that, the one thing the monitor can't tell you is what's not on your machine. So if your machine's not going off, but yet you're still interior and you still have beautiful fleckle, freckles of, of something glimmering in the, in, the, in the interior of the home, you're being exposed to some sort of soot or carcinogen that's going in there. So just be smart about that. Uh, while on scene, uh, exposure reduction. Another successful uh, thing that happened through Local 1285 and their partnership with our fire department was being able to get decon a priority with rehab. Uh, most of us go through rehab when it's formal, when it's uh, lingering, but most of us are still not good at setting up decon. It was so important that all of our new fire engines have been equipped 
with the ability to connect a garden hose, have a sprayer, and have the citrus squeeze. So when you come out in your turnouts in your SCBA, before you even unclick, the idea is that we're coming to the engine, whichever one we set up for decon, we're getting a quick rinse, we're getting a quick spray, and we're getting rid of almost 80% of the contaminants. We're just not there yet as being uh, something that we have changed culture enough to do every single day. That is rather big though. Uh, the wet naps and the baby wraps. We have rescue wipes. We purposely went with those and not baby wipes so that the alpha males don't feel like they're smelling like uh, babies. Okay, we get that. You don't wanna use uh, the Lysol wipe or any alcohol wipe because what that does is it opens up your pores and it actually brings the carcinogens in further. And you want something that's big, sturdy enough that you don't end up with all that white stuff on your head and your face, which the alpha males don't like either. You gotta be able to get into the eyes, get into the nose. But how many of us have jumped into the rig and opened up that pack and it's dried out because it's been so long since we used them? We get them guys and we're free, use them. Uh, change your clothes and wash immediately after fire. That should be pretty uh, self-evident, but I'd, uh, I, you would be surprised, and especially with our newer generation, how many people come back from a big working fire and we smell like fire and we smell like cancer and they go to bed. They don't take a shower, they don't even clean, uh, change their clothes. It's pretty simple, pretty simple change. Clean your PPE and your gloves, your hood. Uh, again, we have the hood exchange, so that's phenomenal. Um, try not to transport that contaminated material back home with you. Decon the apparatus. How many times we had that big fire and we can smell that fire in our rigs for three, four days? That's because we're not deconning it. Um, keep the PPE out of the living areas, which we've been really good. Scheduling our medical exams is huge. The importance and the partnership between local 1285 and our fire department in having the ability to have a medical exam annually. And, and just so you know, anybody that's in local 1285 covered under that group, including dispatchers and prevention are uh, allowed to go down there and have that, that uh, medical exam too. That has been astronomically important in preventing cancer from us. I can't tell you the number of cancers that have been found at the very early stages by an annual checkup. It is huge, 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 huge. Um, don't use tobacco products and obviously use uh, sunscreen. Um, in terms of the Firefighter Cancer Support Network, what we really do is we go out of our way to educate and advocate, but we also provide badge to badge support. So if somebody comes down with a cancer type, we try and pair them with somebody that's had a similar type of cancer to be a cancer coach. We don't pretend to be um, you know, clinicians and we are certainly not clergy, but all we typically are is another firefighter that's had your type of cancer and, and we can provide that support for you and the questions that come from there. We can also send you a toolbox. Uh, in that toolbox, it has a whole bunch of information in there and survivorship and in looking at stuff. Probably the most important thing that you'll hear for us is if you get the diagnosis of having cancer, it's critically important that at the very least you get a second opinion at a National Cancer Institute. That is super, super important. Moving forward, in talking about culture and the change, this is the most critical thing in the fire service right now. We have to be able to look at our behaviors and look at our perceptions and our attitudes and our values and our beliefs about having dirty gear and a dirty helmet as that, as that badge of courage or that physical reminder of how experienced we are in the fire service. And we need to change that because that's what's exposing us day in and day out to fire. And in fact, we need to change it to where the guy with the cleanest stuff is the coolest guy in the station. I know that's difficult, especially for people that have less than five years on because that's our biggest onboarding in the fire service. The other thing that we need to allow us to do, and while the importance of a kitchen table in the fire service cannot go uh, in any way uh, underestimated, because in truth, when most people retire, that kitchen table talk is important. But you've heard from other presenters today that you may have to do a meal replacement or find something better diet that works for you. Why can't we incorporate that into our everyday meal? Just because they're on a diet doesn't mean that they forget that their most important time is family time with the rest of the fire service. Don't give them crap for that. Everybody's on their own plan, their own path. Let them come in. We need to sit together. We need to encourage that better behavior and moving forward. 
But again, that normalization of deviance, and that's a big word, it was coined by NASA. It's from deviating from our known safety protocols. We gotta change the culture in when we walk by a primal event that's not connected that we automatically think we need to connect that. We need to go out of our way to gut check each other about washing our gear and going to our annual physicals. We need to gut check each other and don't even give it an option when we come back from a working fire that we walk around with the clean hoods and throw them at each other so that there's no other way other than doing that. And then as company officers and battalion chiefs, we have to provide the time for those, especially in those busy crews, to go and shower within the hour. This is me in my last day of radiation or my graduation. Because of how rare my, my cancer is, um, I was exposed to about 9,000 R of radiation over 40 days. I'm 13 years in the survivorship and um, it's not quite over yet. While I've survived my primary cancer, I'm actually more at risk for my secondary cancer from the radiation. Don't know when or if that'll ever happen. Um, I still have checkups about every two years and understand for those peers that are around you that have cancer and going for those checkups, the PTSD that you get from going to a checkup and worrying about the fact that you're gonna have cancer again is real. Um, my family, my friends, and especially my wife know that the week that I go for my two year cancer checkup, I'm just off and it is what it is. The radiation in my uh, pituitary gland created some hormonal issues and between balancing and trying to fight my cholesterol and finding where a happy place is in my testosterone, I'm still having problems there. So the reason I tell you that is because even if you fight the battle and you're successful in the battle, you will still have problems with it for the rest of your life and it'll always be there. So why not eliminate the risk and do what we can do now in preventing it from ever happening? That's all I have for you today. Thank you for your time. Jason, how do we activate the cancer support network? If somebody has, comes down with cancer, right. So the question was, how do we activate the Firefighter Cancer Support Network? There's a couple ways. In each fire station, you should have my card and or uh, the uh, eight and a half by 11 sheet that shows where you can actually get help. You can go online and Google uh, Firefighter Cancer Support Network and under there's the resources to reach out for a cancer mentor and also a phone number to call in the event that you need help immediately. You can also reach out to me and call me and I can get you started that way. Cancer's uh, different for every single person. Uh, some people really wanna be private and some people wanna be completely open of it. We can provide whatever level of support that you want. Sometimes people don't want me as their cancer mentor and I get that because I'm an officer at their fire department. Sometimes they don't want anybody in the valley to know because they're that alpha personality that doesn't wanna ever show weakness. That's okay, we can get somebody from out of state. The biggest thing is that we get you a toolbox and we get you set up with best practices and what's done there. And we'll get you a, uh, a mentor from anywhere in the valley and help you out there. That's a great question, thank you. All right. Thank you for your time. Hey, welcome back. Uh, we got the folks from Optimize uh, Physical Therapy. They're going to be going over some movement patterns specific to firefighters and kind of how to address some of our dysfunction. Uh, this is Dr. Zaki. Thank you, Tony. Um, so just a quick introduction uh, on us. Like Tony mentioned, we're from Optimize Physical Therapy Performance. I'm Dr. Zaki. This is Dr. Jeff. And a little story about how we kind of started the practice and uh, the kind of whole philosophy behind it. Um, I began the practice about three years ago with the whole intention of elevating the level of healthcare in the whole Las Vegas Valley. Uh, I saw there was a big hole in the way people were being provided care, whether that was firefighters, general athletes, or, or people just wanted a higher level of care and there wasn't really a place to go. So we started this practice with them in mind and to help them out with uh, getting getting a healthcare practitioner that really cares about them enough to learn about their life, to know the specifics behind their job, their, their lifestyle, and treating them accordingly as a person and not just a shoulder pain or back pain that they come in with. So um, over the past couple of years, we've worked with 
probably a hundred, over a hundred Las Vegas firefighters in the, in the Valley. And we've seen recognizable movement patterns that um, firefighters more typically undergo and the problems that can occur because of that. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, specific dysfunctions on, uh, that we see with firefighters. And with that, we're going to talk a lot about uh, a couple, like couple myths that we've seen out there and some information that I think most people can, uh, can use. And then uh, I'll let Dr. Jeff kind of start with that. Hello, my name is Dr. Jeff, obviously a physical therapist. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about low back pain specifically, um, mainly because low back pain is super, super prevalent in uh, your guys' profession and in the entire world. 80% uh, of the population in this world is going to deal with low back pain at some point in their life. That's the entire world. That's like 7 billion people are going to have low back pain at some point. And more specifically for you guys as firefighters, back injuries account for up to 50% of all line of duty injuries and retirements each year. So what does that mean? All those early, early retirements that you hear about uh, with all your brothers, 50% of those are likely due to a low back injury of some sort. And lastly, back pain is nonspecific. What do I mean by that? So there's different variables that incorporate to uh, allow back pain to fester and manifest in your, uh, in your body. So it's not just, oh, this little muscle right over here uh, is a little bit strained, I've got low back pain. Sure, it can be, but low back pain is accumulation of a lot of different things of physical stress, uh, no sleep like we've talked about, poor nutrition, high stressful environments and emotional environments. I don't know about you, but I could think of an occupation that kind of entails all those things. Firefighters. So knowing that low back pain is nonspecific, it's going to be super, super important for all of you guys to be proactive and not reactive about your recovery and about your prevention of this. You guys all chose to be firefighters. You know you have sleepless nights. You know you're in a high stress environment and you know you have super, super physically demanding uh, things that you know your body has to do on a day-to-day -day basis so it's super important for you to seek out care seek out what you need to do to take care of this and not wait for it to come and help you later on if you're chasing low back pain it's gonna beat you nine times out of ten but if you get in front of it and prevent it we can do that almost ten times out of ten so how do you do that uh, first things first is it's really, really good to have a vital and strong support system. Lucky for you guys, you guys have a brotherhood and you guys were born into a strong support system. You've got brothers and sisters surrounding you constantly day to day that you can shoot ideas off with, ask for help, uh, get a referral to someone that you know has helped you in the past. So having that strong support system that, you know, maybe you need to be a little vulnerable with somebody. Having that person or the group of people that you can constantly go to for support is really, really important to preventing this kind of a pain from becoming like a chronic long-term pain that leads you to an early retirement. Uh, secondly, it's really, really important to have a great medical team. Uh, to take it one step further, it's important to have a medical team that knows exactly what you guys do and the different things that need to be rehabbed or corrected so you guys go back out into the field and are prepared for the demands that your job requires. Um, so let's take, for example, you guys know Tony Klinker. If not, he was the extremely large man that could snap me in half that introduced us. If he comes into a uh, physical therapy clinic and let's say he hurt his shoulder and he comes in, gets his evaluation, and the guy says, yeah, cool, cool. Let's, uh, let's get this guy uh, rehabbed up. Let's have you go into the corner. Let's grab this little, little yellow TheraBand over here and let's do uh, two sets of 10 this way, two sets of 10 this way, two sets of 10 this way. We'll get you back, throw an ice pack on you. We'll get you feeling better. Maybe he feels a little bit better, but let's say three, four days later, Clink's got to go out into the field and throw a 300 pound woman over his shoulder and run out of a building. How many of you think that those uh, TheraBand exercises and that ice pack really prepared his tissues and his body to yeah, make that happen. And he's gonna be able to do that safely. I'm gonna probably say no. So super, super important to find a medical team and a place that knows what you guys do, the demands of your body, and can train you to get back specifically for what you guys do in the field. 
And third, you have to maintain peak physical performance. Sprains and strains are the most common injuries in low back and uh, they can be prevented. And so in order to do that, we want to ensure that you have adequate range of motion and mobility in your spine. So think about a, uh, a short runway and a long runway. Oh, I probably shouldn't take that far away from my face. Sorry about that. A short runway and a long runway for a plane. Short runway, that plane isn't going to have a lot of time to do what it needs to do to get to full power, to do all the correct safety measures before it takes off. Now let's say you got a long runway. Now that plane's got adequate time to do everything it needs to have a safe, uh, a safe departure from that runway. Same kind of thing works with your body. You got to give your muscles, you got to give your joints, you got to give your tissues adequate time to produce that force and power and stabilize those joints that you need to in order to, you know, do perform those movements that you need to do safely and efficiently. And uh, second, you have to ensure that you have adequate strength in the muscles that move and stabilize the back. I know a lot of you guys will think like, yeah, I squat, I deadlift, I'm good. Well, if you know, we worked in a perfect one plane motion of just doing this kind of motion, you're probably right, you would be fine. But out there in the field, there's twisting, there's turning, there's bending, there's hiking. Training the muscles that do all those little small intricate movements as well are equally as important to preventing low back pain rather than the big, huge, bulky muscles that we want to focus on like squats and deadlifts. And thirdly, we have to ensure that you can produce adequate power. So the strength is important, but power adds that speed factor into those motions as well. You guys as firefighters, you don't just lift or perform activities in a nice, slow, smooth motion. Sometimes you have to move quickly. You got to throw an ax super quick. You got to throw a, a ladder over your shoulder super quick. Pick somebody up super quick. Run, jump, all those kinds of things. You have to train your tissues to be able to handle those kinds of forces. They're a different kind of force that the body has that has to be able to produce in order to prevent injury. If you're not prepared to produce a movement with correct speed on top of correct strength, that's when things go snap, pop, and crack, and that's not what we want. And lastly, I want to talk a little bit about posture. A lot of people that have low back pain, chronic low back pain, are told, well, maybe you're not sitting properly, or maybe I need to stand properly and stand with the perfect posture. Well, I'm here to tell you that there is no such thing as perfect posture. If I sit at the desk like this, and I'm typing, you would say, yeah, that looks awful. That's probably not a great posture, but that becomes not a great posture when I sit in that position for three hours and don't change that position at any time. It's the same thing with your perfect posture too. If I have you stand up like this, nice and tall and nice and extended, but you don't move out of this position for three hours, I guarantee your low back is not going to feel any better. The important thing is to be able to move in and out of posture efficiently and smoothly. That's when posture is the most important concept to do to decrease the low back pain, not to stay in it for a certain amount of time. That's when posture becomes poor posture. So the good news is, is that everything I just talked about and low back pain in general is modifiable, it's correctable, and it can be changed. You're not stuck with this inevitable future that oh, I'm, I'm going to get low back pain because I'm a firefighter. No, that's not the case. Anything can be changed in terms of the biomechanics, the strength and the conditioning of the spine. You guys just need to implement some of the things that we talked about. Seek medical help when you need it. And that extra little bit, if you've got a question, if it's just not getting right, there's professionals out there that know what they're doing and can help you get the rest of the way. And if you do those things, I guarantee you'll enjoy a well-earned retirement. Dr. Zaki, the owner of Optimize, is going to talk a little bit about the shoulder now. Thank you. All right, cool, cool. Um, so kind of uh, piggybacking up what Jeff was talking about, um, I think the, the biggest thing I want to get through with, with my time here is uh, instilling the beliefs that or breaking down the beliefs that some people have about their bodies especially when they've dealt with pain for quite a while so um, the, the term I kind of use around the office and with my patients is beliefs drive behaviors and those drive your outcomes. So say your outcome is to live a pain, pain free life and, and functioning body, right? And the behavior you have for that, you know, having good exercise routine, good diet, good sleep. And 
the, the core of those, you do those things because you believe them to help. But if you've been on Dr. Google searching up stuff about your shoulder, about your low back, and you see the belief is, you know, because you have a torn rotary cuff or because, you know, my discs are, are blown out in my low back, then the behavior is going to be different. You think you need to get fixed. You think you need to see a surgeon to fix these things before you feel better. Whereas most of the time, that's not the case. So I want to kind of tackle those beliefs first and start breaking down some myths when it comes to shoulder pain. We'll even talk a little bit about knee pain as well. Um, so knee pain after, after low back pain is the next most prevalent. And then after that, shoulder pain in terms of uh, incidents of uh, painful sites for firefighters. So with, with shoulder pain, a couple of things that some practitioners will tell you about is that they think it's your, uh, your scapula not moving properly, scapular dyskinesis, right? And the first thing is to the naked eye, one practitioner can't tell the difference between a couple degree difference with one shoulder blade versus the other. Um, so a lot of times the person assessing you under these conditions um, cannot tell that difference to make that diagnosis in the first place. Second of all, the scapular dyskinesis, which means one scapula moves a little bit differently than the other, is completely normal in almost every single person on earth, right? We have one dominant shoulder usually sits a little bit lower, one uh, non-dominant shoulder usually sits a little bit higher, so the movement patterns are going to be different based on on your activities, not because you're doomed because one shoulder moves a little bit differently than the other. So when it comes to knee pain, shoulder pain, the body in general, asymmetries are perfectly normal and you don't need to chase asymmetries to, asymmetries to feel better. If one shoulder moves a little bit less than the other, okay, we can, we can get some shoulders moving better, a knee moving better, a low back moving better, but you don't need to be perfectly symmetrical. Uh, asymmetry is a, a foundation of, of the human evolution system, right? There's a reason why our heart is only on one side of the body. Uh, one side of our lungs have an extra lobe, the other one doesn't, right? We only have one spleen over on one side. The, the stomach is shifted over to one side. We are built asymm asymmetrical, so chasing symmetry is, is usually a, a road that will kind of lead to more frustrations than anything else. Uh, one of our previous uh, presenters, actually Chief Abercrombie, was talking about um, uh, not being a perfectionist when it comes to reducing your stress levels. And that kind of goes along, uh, along the lines of that. If you chase perfect symmetry first, you'll probably never achieve it. And second of all, um, you're going to be adding in that perfectionist mindset that's just going to lead you down a road of more stress and more not being happy with your own body and your own self. So, and, and it seems like something, something that, you know, I should be up here talking about, you know, biomechanics and stuff, but if, if you could have, you could have the perfect moving body and it can still have pain if you don't look at the other factors. Right. Um, in, in our experience and the research that we've seen with biomechanics, we've seen that movement preparedness trumps movement quality. You can be the absolute best ladder thrower on the, on, in the department, but if you've never prepared for that activity, you're going to have a harder time that even that sloppy person that throws that ladder up if they've done it a thousand times, right? There's, there's marathon runners out there that, that have uh, atypical running form that are world record setters, right? There, there's people out there lifting four times their body weight in a deadlift with severe scoliosis. So the way your body's built shouldn't limit the beliefs you have in your body and what you can possibly do. It comes from your preparedness and your overall, um, overall, you know, self image of your body is, is a big part of that. So that's a reason why I wanted to talk about that. Um, when it, other, other uh, things that we know about the shoulder specifically is some people think they have uh, impingement, subacromial impingement. As I raise my shoulder up, there's a space where my rotator cuff tendon sit that's getting pinched down. Um, anytime you hear the words pinch or impingement, things like that, you want to take it with a little bit of a grain of salt, especially if a practitioner is trying to push that on you is this is why you're dealing with it. Our body is made to be pinched, squeezed, and nerves and tendons are made to be able to do that and handle that. Every time I sit down, I'm pressing hundreds of pounds of force on my sciatic nerve, but not everybody's walking around with sciatica, right? So how can, how can one little like, you know, pressure point in your spine Talk, like explain the symptoms going down your leg, right? So understanding that it's not a very simplistic view we should have on symptoms. We should be looking at you as a whole person. Same thing with the shoulder. That space that the rotator cuff tendon sit in, it's called the subacromial space. And when you raise your arm overhead, whether you have pain or not, that space closes down on those tendons. That is a normal movement to have. So if someone's telling you your shoulder pain is coming from that space closing down, then how can they explain every single other person having that same space closing down by not having pain, right? So, so taking a very simplistic view on pain is almost a road that leads to a lot of frustration because then say you go get an MRI, MRI is completely clean, right? You get this MRI and you say, well, what's wrong? Then, then you have no answers. 
right? But realistically, a clean MRI is one of the best things you can have, right? A clean slate of health. But some people look at that and be like, well, I've been told to have this. Now I'm back at square one. Now they're more frustrated. So, so the words that practitioners say to you and the words you, you read online, whether it's WebMD or another person, take them with a grain of salt. Look at everything with a little bit of healthy skepticism because the person making those claims, whether it's me or someone else, should have, it, the burden of proof is on them, not on you to believe them and disprove them. They should be able to prove what they're, what they're talking about. So um, some myths that we talk about with the knees, one of the biggest ones we see is not letting the knees go over toes during training. So there was a study that was done that, uh, that this whole debate was kind of sparked around, right? So the, the debate was sparked around a study that they did. They had two different groups of people squat. One person, one group just like, you know, squatted normally, knees going over the toes. The other group had a box in front of them or a wall, so they couldn't squat with their knees over their toes. And what they found was in the, in the group that let the knees go over the toes, there was about a 40% increase in stress at the knee biomechanically. And then all these biomechanists look at that movement pattern and say, oh, there it is. That's what increases stress of the knee, let's stop doing that. But they didn't look at where this, when they don't let the knees go over the toes, okay, they're taking 40% of stress off the knees, but where's that stress going? They found that stress was actually displaced to the hip and lower back and a thousand percent increase at the hip and lower back. And to me, when I'm squatting with my knees go, letting go over my toes and get 40% increase, that's an easy trade-off to avoid a thousand percent increase in stress here, lifting the same weight, doing the same movement pattern. So everything needs to have some context behind it. Looking at numbers and saying, you know, I need to believe this number because this number is right, there always needs to be context behind it or else you're, you're believing information that might not apply to you specifically or you're, you're losing out on another possible benefit, right? So when, when we talk about pain in itself. Um, there's a lot more science, a lot more studies being done on pain and what it actually means to people that are actually having pain. Um, like I said, there's people out there that have, have pain that's almost um, uh, unexplainable, right? And when it, comes to, uh, when it comes to pain, we have to understand that it doesn't always mean something's being damaged or injured. That, if you got anything away, take anything away from my talk today, that's the number one point. When you have pain, it's normal to have pain at certain points of your life, and it doesn't mean you're damaged or injured all the time, right? There's people out there that, uh, I'm sure we've heard of phantom limb syndrome, where they have their whole arm chopped off or leg, leg amputated, and they still have pain in that leg, and that leg doesn't even exist anymore. Right? So understanding that, that pain is a construct of how the body views, uh, how the brain views the body. Without a brain, there is no pain. Right? So pain is not an input. I don't have pain receptors in my body. I have, I have receptors in my body that can, I can gather information from. That all goes to my brain and my brain decides, hey, is it a good time for this person to feel pain or not? If, I, if, I walk, if I'm walking across a busy street, I twist my ankle, I'm not gonna sit there, you know, crying about my ankle, my body's not gonna let me feel pain. It's gonna make me get up and get out of that busy road before I get hit by a bus, right? But if I'm walking in a you know, nice field of flowers that twist my ankle, I might have more time to focus on that area, right? So with the same kind of injury, having different kinds of pain kind of shows you that it's not 100% correlated um, when it comes to pain and the, the, what you see on an MRI or, or an X-ray, right? And the other thing I want to talk about as well is a lot of people talk about what's the harm in getting an MRI? Why, don't I, why can't I just see what the inside of my body kind of looks like? Um, they've done studies and shown that when you get an early MRI before it's warranted, before you've tried the, the, tip, the, the good non-invasive route, your chances of getting uh, injections or surgeries in the low back increase anywhere from 13 to 26 times higher. So for the same kind of symptoms that somebody else is feeling, whether it's low back pain or pain down the leg, whatever it is, um, your chances of getting injections and surgery and more invasive procedures that may or may not work increase substantially because you have an early MRI. So when, when somebody just wants to see the inside of your body, a lot of times it's because to either appease you as a firefighter because you want the MRI, that healthcare practitioner should be fighting for you to not get an early MRI. There's certain things that, okay, MRI or X-ray is, is pretty required, but for the most case, low back pain, shoulder pain, knee pain, pain generally isn't the best idea to get MRI without doing the prerequisite kind of non-invasive procedures first, all right? So um, as, we, as we kind of move along the, the firefighter spectrum, right, what we've seen for the, for the most part is every time a firefighter comes in to see us, um, we ask for the first question, how long have you been dealing with the issue you come in for? I would say, <laughs> maybe 90, 95% of the time, it's over two to three years, 
that they've been dealing with the same issue without getting that help. And it's, it's a constant theme that we've seen throughout every single presentation that we've talked about today. You have support systems, you have ways to get help. Please, please, please use them because we all, every single person that's come up and talked, we care about you as a person and as firefighters. We know the service you provide to this city and to this county is, is huge. And without you, the, the, the system kind of breaks down. So whatever we can do to help, we're here to help. But you need to take the first step and, and ask for that help or get referred to somebody that can help you guys out. Um, and, and that is the most important thing because the thing that we've seen with firefighters that don't want help if you have to drag them into door you have to drag them around the place so and that's not that's not fun for anybody right to work with somebody that doesn't want to be there so f first you have to kind of shift that mindset on you know I have to deal with this pain this pain is just a normal part of firefighter culture that that's not necessarily true so let's let's kind of try to break that mold and, and go ask for help when you need help okay so uh, in conclusion like we've talked about pain doesn't necessarily mean damage you have a very, very good network, at least in Las Vegas specifically, and whoever else watches this, I'm sure you have people around you, healthcare practitioners, your brothers and sisters that really, really care about you, lean on them more and more. Pain is not just a biological construct, we look at it as a biopsychosocial construct. There's a lot of psychology that goes into it and a big social construct behind it as well. So please, if you're dealing with any of the stuff we've talked about, get the help you need. I hope you know this, this information is, is beneficial uh, to some people to at least get that started. Because I can't sit here and tell you the exact movement that is gonna help you without assessing you, and that comes from you first taking the step and uh, getting the help you need. So thank you. And any questions at all? Cool. All right. Thank you, guys. All right. <clears throat> Everybody, thanks for sticking around. This is our last presenter. You might recognize this little fellow. This is Darren Waller, uh, our Las Vegas Raider <laughs> pro ball tight end. So Darren's going to tell us about his story, and it's pretty. it's a pretty good one. So... Uh, my name is Darren Waller. I play football for the Las Vegas Raiders. Um, I'm a drug addict and alcoholic in recovery. I'll, I'm coming up on five years uh, of sobriety. And, you know, I've had the opportunity to, to speak to firefighters before, and it's, and it's always an honor to be able to be here on this platform and to share and speak and, you know, give, give my experience and my story to share. Um, for me, I see a lot of similarities in my field of work and in the work that you guys do. Um, I feel like it takes uh, an incredible level of toughness to, to do what we do. Uh, it, it takes having a couple screws loose to run towards what everybody else may be running from in times of danger, in times of, of high stress. And in that, I feel like there are a lot of great qualities that we develop but at the same time, I feel like there are certain things that we may neglect. And I know for me, you know, going into those environments and all the things that it demands of me, I tend to neglect me at times. I neglect the, the human being that's in the uniform that has to go and do what needs to be done. And for me, I look at that and I'm like, why is that? You know, if, if you're not familiar with my story, um, I, yeah, I've been suspended from every level of athletics possible. I got kicked off my high school basketball team, uh, suspended from my college team multiple times, suspended in the NFL multiple times, um, been arrested three times, drugs, alcohol, all of that. And it's like, okay, of course it's a drug and an alcohol issue, but as I look back on it now and having gone through the work that I needed to work to, to get to sobriety, it's is really more of an identity issue. Like, and by identity, I mean like, who am I? Like, and why, why am I this way? Why do I do the things that I do? And for me, that identity starts with um, certain emotional wounds. Like I talk about the similarities between us. Football wise, like, if you look at a player and they're not, their name is not on the injury report, I guarantee you they're probably dealing with like three different injuries and you just don't know. And, you, and we continue to put ourselves out into the field and to do our job anyways. And firefighters as well, we know how to deal with this physical pain and to fight through it and to, continue, and to put ourselves out there and to accomplish what we need to accomplish and to provide. 
and that is outstanding and it should be applauded. But at the same time, there are these emotional injuries and these emotional traumas that happen that nobody can see. And from young ages, we're taught that we should hide, we should put to the side and not deal with and not bring to light. And those are the things that ultimately bring us down. I looked to myself when I was younger, um, one of the emotional wounds that I had to uncover and just was really an aha moment for me was when I was younger, I used to, you know, get made fun of and be described as not being black enough. And it's like, okay, like, you know, certain, there's like the stigma of like acting black, you talk this way, you act this way, you listen to this kind of music, you're just supposed to be in a certain box. But as time went along, I realized like how, why it has such an impact on me. It's because I walk around with black skin everywhere that I go. There's no way that I could possibly change this. And every time I may look in the mirror, every time I'm reminded of who I am, I have this black skin and the narrative is not being black enough. There's no possible way that I could ever change that or, or change my skin color. Because if I'm not enough as black, like maybe I could change my skin color, but I can't. Like I'm stuck with this. And so I was stuck with that narrative as well. Um, and when I was in sixth grade, I don't think I've ever told this publicly, uh, I had a girlfriend in sixth grade. And, um, you know, sixth grade love, it is what it is. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I had this relationship with this girl or whatever. And there's this teen club we used to go to. Uh, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, sub suburbs. There's this teen club that we would go to and, you know, going about to meet my girlfriend at the teen club and I get there and she's all over this like older kid who's a couple years older in middle school. And it's just kind of humiliating. Like all my f friends were there, people that I know were there. And it's just like a crushing moment. And it's like, you know, how do I never, how do I not feel this way ever again? Like feeling lonely, feeling exiled, feeling like I'm not worthy of love. And so you take the not being black enough, not being, feel like I'm worthy of love and those things being inside me, it's like, how do I change this? How do I feel different? And you know, it turns into, it gets to people pleasing at first. Like how can I change who I am, change the way that I act to, to get you to accept me, to get you to see me as enough because I don't feel that way inside of myself. And you can't win that game, you know? There's 7 billion people on this earth um, I could have a fantastic game out there. I swear, if you go into the comments and dig for something, somebody's gonna be in there trashing me somewhere, you know? So it's like, you can't win that game in life. And, you know, and when those things don't work, you just continue to go to desperate measures. And so you look at, you know, a kid like me that was introverted, weird, quiet, just shy, um, you know, very sensitive. Like, how does somebody like him get involved in drugs and alcohol in this way? And it's just like, you know, I just had to find, things didn't work for me to feel better about myself. So I had to just keep finding something that was stronger at making me feel better or was stronger at quieting the thoughts down and the emotions. And, you know, that's what happened for me. You know, when I was 15, I started uh, doing pills like painkillers, oxycodones, started smoking weed, started drinking. And yeah, it was to part of, partly be a part of a crowd, but it was really just to, to, to change the way that I felt. And I feel like, that is, you know, oftentimes what can keep us in these states of hopelessness in a way. Um, and, you know, we can, be, we can be so good at our jobs, we can be respected as the men and women of strength in, you know, our locker rooms, in our rooms where, you know, we get together and, you know, we're, we can share these war stories and whatnot, but really, you know, we're kind of falling apart on the inside and we're not even aware of that fact. Um, and for me, it took 10 years of being in that mess, in that lifestyle, and you know, being forced to stop, you know, overdosing and having to be like in this place of fear and just like, okay, now I really don't think I can control what's going on. I could, I could go with the facade of division one college athlete, um, you know, in the NFL, you know, comp checking every single box of accomplishments off, but still being left with a sense of emptiness and like why, like essentially why is this not enough? And it's because very early on I made this decision that um, my performance was more important 
than just who I was. Like somehow along the way, getting to a certain point was more important than the person I was becoming along the way. And that's, that can't be a sacrifice that we're willing to make in order for us to live healthy lifestyles, in order to survive, in order to continue to move on. And it's like, you know, I sit, I'm sitting here and learning all these things today and hearing these people talk about ways that we can take care of ourselves physically, uh, ways that we can improve our lifestyle, improve the way that we eat, improve the way that we do these things. But if I don't feel like I'm worthy of investing in, then I'm not gonna do any of these things. Like, I have to really know how I feel about myself. I often think of, you know, growing up in church when I was a kid, you always hear the principle of love your neighbor as you love yourself. And it's like, how can, there's no way you can possibly love someone else or go, go about living a lifestyle of love unless you know how much love you have for you. Like, your neighbor as yourself. Well, if I don't have love for me, then I don't have love for other people. I'm not, if I don't take the time to reflect and understand me, I'm not going to Attempt, attempt to reflect and understand somebody else that may have a different background than me, that may have different ideals or different beliefs than me. Like, I'm not going to take that time. I'm not going to invest in these exercises that my physical therapist is telling me to do uh, because, yeah, they are inconvenient, but I have to see past the inconvenience and see that the longevity and the benefit that it's providing me when I put myself in these situations. And yeah, dealing with these emotional wounds is a very uncomfortable process. It's not it's very easy to continue to put it under the rug. It's very easy to continue to put ourselves into work and to rely on what I can accomplish and this and third, because that's what we've been taught our whole lives. And here I am today saying and admitting and knowing that my life has gotten better because I've chosen to go the uncomfortable route of unlearning all the things I was taught when I was younger. Because it was always, never let them see you sweat, man. Why you, why you crying? Like, why are you, why are you doing this? Why are you acting that way? Like, man, just, like forget all that, and it's like I can't I can't forget all of that. Like I I can think I'm forgetting all that, but I'm carrying this baggage and this pain around with me every single place that I go. And you know, at some point we gotta realize like what's the cost? Like what's the cost of me making all this money? Like what's the cost of me being the best at my job? You know, but I go home and you know I can't sleep unless I put copious amounts of drugs and alcohol in my body. Like at what at what point is is enough enough and you know it took going to rehab for me where people say rehab is for crazy people you know it takes therapy where if you see a therapist something's got something's got to be wrong like i still see a therapist every day or every week to this day and it's taken these points of investment in myself the best thing i could ever do was to put the entire world on hold and go to rehab for 30 days and to learn a different way of living this life of loving myself, of appreciating myself, and making sure that the human being is right before I ever put a uniform on ever again and go out into the field and do what I have to do. You know, I had it backwards the whole time. It was like, well, if I just did better and if I performed better and if I was good, then I'll feel better about myself. But no, it has to be the other way around. It has to be, I feel good about me. I love what I'm about. I respect what I'm about when I look in the mirror. And then from there, that's when the performance takes care of itself. It, 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 there's no way it could possibly be the other way around. And, and it's indicative of my career. If you look at my football career, prior to me getting sober, going to rehab, doing all these things, and looking at it after, it's completely different. And it's not, I don't think it is really anything physical. I feel like it was all something on the inside. It was an emotional transformation and a spiritual transformation. And, you know, as far as spiritual, I just basically mean like, a purpose being greater than just you and what you want and what you're seeking in this world because we're self-centered people. We want pleasure, we want comfort, we want things, we want them the easiest way possible. But you know, for me, a, a spiritual awakening is something where you have a purpose that's bigger than you. Like no matter how I may feel, the most important thing to me is my impact being left on the world, my impact being left on people. And there's no possible way I could have done that without looking at these things that the world sees as taboo and as things for crazy people and it, it's just not that way these are these are things these are weapons that we need to have therapy meditation journaling all these things counseling like whatever it is because we can't go through life without while holding things in um if i could recommend one thing it's 
having somebody, no matter who it is, that you can be completely honest with about everything, every single thing that you're going through. Because one thing you may hold back will continue to fester and will continue to, you'll have to feed it some way through addiction, through whatever, whatever possible addiction it could possibly be. You're going to have to continue to feed that and to continue to hide that. And hiding prevents freedom and freedom and no freedom in your life prevents you from being ultimately being the best person you could possibly be the best firefighter you could possibly be the best football player you could possibly be the best whatever father wife husband like we can't we can no longer hold ourselves back from being that just because it's uncomfortable for us to share our feelings to share what we've gone through and to let that go um there's so much more relying on it than just our sense of comfortability so you know, that's, that, that's the message that I try to communicate. Um, the best things about my life today aren't contracts or yardage or however many people follow me or if I'm on uh, TV and all this, it's really being a part of something that's bigger than myself. Um, because I mean, even to this day, it's, still, it's, it's not the most comfortable thing in the world to just come up and get on camera and get in front of people and be like, this is who I am, this is what I've gone through. But you know, if it allows somebody to, uh, something to shift in somebody's, somebody else's mind and to be like, to get them to evaluate why they do the things that they do and to seek a possible change and then to be like, you know what, what I've been doing isn't enough. The world has been telling me it should be enough, but it's not. Like, how do I go about this differently? That's the best possible thing that I could do and that really fills me up inside and makes me feel like that, you know, I'm doing something that's worthwhile because, you know, before when you're, you know, when you're in addiction, all you, all you your world spins around you when you want to get high, you know, what you can get at the time that you want to get it, and you can use people and use all these things in order for you to get what you want. And that leads to nothing but emptiness and just futility and just, you know, a, a spiritual stench on the inside of you that you smell everywhere you take yourself. So uh, I'm just grateful to be here to share my story. Hopefully you guys can take some from this and to, you know, learn, apply, and to, you know, inject yourselves back into society to be the best people you could possibly be. That's all I got. What, uh, what's the hardest part about staying consistent? Or like, how do you manage consistency? Um, the hardest part about staying consistent is, I would say making, having the willingness to be uncomfortable on a day to day, daily basis. Um, I feel like everything as far as my physical routine is uncomfortable as far as workouts. Um, you talk about nutrition, uh, I feel like it's uncomfortable to sacrifice the foods that you may want to eat as opposed to what you should eat. Um, I feel like it's uncomfortable to sacrifice certain people that you need to hang around, uh, certain types of content that you need to be taking in every day that may not be nourishing you. So I would say consistency is all about keeping yourself in a place of uh, uncomfortability and also, you know, striving for a sense of humility because it's very easy to be, to stay in our pride as human beings and then feel like we know certain things and to feel like, you know, we got it under control at all times, but really we need to learn at all times, which requires us admitting that we don't know everything and we need to have people around us that we can lean on because we're not always gonna be strong even though we feel like that's what we should be. So it's uncomfortable to do a lot, all those things, but you gotta step into it. If you could, uh, if you could go back and ask for help, how would you go about doing that? Hmm. If I could go back and ask for help, when I was 15 years old, I would've just talked to my guidance counselor probably or, uh, or just went to my parents and just told them exactly what I was feeling, you know, um, because I don't, I don't know, we're, we're taught to hide so many things. And, and even as parents, you know, we sometimes, like I feel like parents will present our, themselves to kids like, like they never messed up or like they never did the things that they did. And it's like, you know, I would try to talk to them, but I mean, I don't know, I guess the way that I can change that is when I become a parent, I can, let them know everything that I did instead of being like, man, why are you doing that? Like, why are you acting like that? But just be real. So I don't know. I'll start with just talking to a counselor, talking to anybody, really just getting those feelings out of me. Like, hey, this is this is what I'm feeling because me holding held, holding it inside took me on a ride that I didn't plan on going on for another 10 years after that. So 
just somebody around me just word vomiting essentially. All right, everybody, uh, that, that's it. Thank you for tuning in. Um, we're gonna edit this and stick it back on YouTube later. So uh, Charlie and Jason and Optimize's information, if you wanna reach out to them, is gonna be there. Uh, also, we gotta thank a bunch of people behind the scenes. Uh, Morgan Uhas, Chad Paddock, and this wouldn't have gone down today without Mike Willis working the technology. So. Uh, thanks to everybody. Thanks to all the presenters. Uh, this is hopefully the first of many. Uh, thank you all for tuning in.